Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Community Housing Forum sponsored by the City of Augusta and the Augusta Housing Authority. I want to welcome you all here. Uh, I don't know that we've had such a full house uh, at any of our City Council meetings, which I guess says more about the City Council meetings than anything else. Uh, but I want to welcome you here. This is an extraordinarily important topic. And I also want to uh, uh, thank Amanda, uh, the, uh, the new director of the Augusta Housing Authority, uh, for taking the lead on this. Amanda, thank you so much for uh, your uh, energy uh, and your passion for this, for this subject. Uh, we've had a, a very eventful year in the area of housing in Augusta, as many of you may be aware. And so this is a very a timely forum, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot tonight uh, from all of you. So uh, at this, uh, I'll turn it over to Amanda, and uh, thank you again. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Amanda Bartlett. I'm the new executive director at Augusta Housing Authority. Um, I have to say it's really a dream come true to have the opportunity to affect positive change within the housing landscape of my hometown community here in Augusta. Um, the purpose of tonight's forum is really just to provide information and get ideas to improve housing opportunities. Um, as the mayor said, we're probably all aware that there are significant challenges with regards to housing and neighborhoods here in Augusta. Um, and the time is ripe for us to come together as a community and have a conversation about all of these, these issues. <laughs> Um, I would like to thank all of you for coming. It's so nice to see a full house here tonight. Um, and a special thank you to the City Council, Mayor Stokes, and City Manager Bill Bergio for your support in this effort. We look forward to working closely with you towards our shared goals of improving neighborhoods, affordable housing opportunities, and the city as a whole. Thank you to the Augusta Housing Authority Board of Commissioners and Augusta Housing Authority staff um, who are all here tonight as well for your support and enthusiasm as we set sail tonight on the beginning of a multi-phase strategic planning process for the Housing Authority with our Captain Frank O'Hara. <laughs> I would also like to take a moment just to acknowledge a couple of special guests here this evening. Chuck Molaris, who's representing the Honorable Senator Susan Collins, and uh, Representative Matthew Pouliot. The attendance here tonight really sends a message loud and clear. The availability of safe, affordable housing affects all of us. I'm going to take a moment to share something I read recently about housing that really struck a chord. A home is a roof over one's head, a warm, dry place to sleep, but it is also more than that. It is a place of safety and security, a way of building up savings for the future, a place to entertain and deepen friendships, and a place to express yourself in design and color. You see, a home is so much more than bricks and mortar. It is a piece of us, and so our neighborhoods blanket our city like patchwork quilts, each patch representing the individuals who together form the fabric of the community we are. Quality housing is a major contributing factor to the overall livability and beautification of our city, a workforce recruitment tool and an economic development engine. We look forward to contributing to future efforts that will improve all of these many facets of life here in Augusta. I would like to start the evening off with a few key housing facts that set the stage for the remaining presentations. So as you can see, for those of you who are lucky enough to get an agenda, we didn't expect quite so many people. Um, we are expecting to have presentations tonight from Margaret Bean, who's the Deputy Director of Maine State Housing Authority, Dean Lachance from Bread of Life Ministries, Perry McCourtney from Sprague and Curtis Real Estate, Matt Nazar and Rob Overton from the City of Augusta. And then we'll hear some initial uh, reactions from council and uh, board members from the Housing Authority. And then we'll open it up for a period of public comment, and then there will be a final discussion. And again, our goal tonight is really to listen to each other, learn what we can, and brainstorm some ideas for the future of housing here in our community. It won't be a decision-making session. Mm -hmm. 
so probably most of you are aware of the Augusta Housing Authority and what we do, but I did want to provide just a quick overview. Um, we started in 1979 to provide low and moderate income households with housing opportunities. Um, we bring about two and a half million dollars per year into the rental housing stock in Augusta. We are currently a voucher only program, meaning we don't own any housing um, and we haven't developed any housing. Um, but we did help 580 households in 2013. Um, so we do have a significant impact on the, on the community and help many uh, low and moderate income families. So this next graph is really telling. Um, this shows the median household income, and it runs from a span of 1990 to 2012, and shows median income of Augusta, Kennebec County, and Maine. And you can see that in 1990, we were all about at the same place. And now, in 2012, you can see that we're pretty flat in Augusta, we're that bottom line. So our median income has lagged in comparison to Kennebec County um, and Maine as a whole. Our median income in 2012 was about $35,000. Um, and we have 61% of Augusta households now falling in the low and moderate income category, which is defined as 80% or below uh, of median household income. This, sli this slide represents uh, the various age groups and um, the numbers of households that fall within these age groups in 2000, 2010, and projected for 2020. And so the bars on the right hand in each side is the projection. And you can see that by 2020, we are expecting a large increase as the baby boomers age. So that 55 to 64 and 65 to 74 age group is really going to expand um, moving towards 2020. And again, Amanda, these are the numbers for Kennebec County or Augusta? These are Augusta, Augusta I believe. Augusta yeah. numbers. <clears throat> This slide represents a change in demand from 2010 to 2020. Um, and again, this is based on projections. Um, it's kind of a different way of looking at uh, some of the information we saw in the last slide. Um, again, you'll see an increased demand on both the renter and owner side for um, housing units for the 55 to 64 and 65 to 74. And you'll see um, a corresponding decrease in the 45 to 54 age group as those folks um, age into the next category. And this really speaks to maybe some opportunities for filling Cindy Taylor's new units at Coney. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe some other things too, like in town condominiums for retirees. So here's some data around um, the percentage of our population that has a disability. And um, it's, it's interesting, it's really no surprise, I think, to any of us that Augusta is showing a higher rate of disability than surrounding communities. We are a service center. Um, but if you look in the young adult group, in the graph on the right-hand side, um, Adults in our community ages 18 to 34, 17% of those residents have a cognitive disability, whereas there's only 6% only of the corresponding age group in Maine or 8% for Kennebec County have a cognitive disability. Um, so there's you know, some, some pretty high numbers here with regards to <coughs> the percentage of population with um, both cognitive and physical um, disabilities in our community. Um, and I think Margaret Bean's planning to speak a little bit later to um, some of the special needs housing that has been developed here 
in Augusta um, with Maine Housing Financing. So when we look at ownership, Augusta homes do cost less than in Kennebec County or Maine with an average, with a median home value of $133,000. Um, and Maine's median home value is $175,000. Um, but we're still, we still can't afford home ownership. 22% um, of homeowners in Augusta are paying over 35% of their income for, for owner costs. <coughs> It's really the same story in the rental market. The average, the median gross rent, rather, in Augusta is 642, and in Maine it's 750. However, 45% of folks in Augusta are paying more than 35% of their income in rental costs. So that's huge. That's almost half of the renters who are paying just a, a huge portion of their income um, to have housing. This data is really looking at uh, when housing stock was built. Um, and as you can see <coughs> on the left-hand side, um, that, that tallest column there is housing built prior to 1939. Um, and you can see that that's where most of our housing is. We know that Maine has the oldest housing stock in the nation. Um, the big decades for single family housing development were post war 1950 to 1979, and the big decades for rental really were early 1900s um, and 1960 to 1979. And we know that the aging housing stock is really a contributing factor to the poor housing conditions that we've seen over the past few years, um, and also lends itself to a lack of desirability for new and younger buyers. <clears throat> so on the Housing Authority side, um, last year we had 22 families that were displaced due to um, specifically life safety code issues, um, nine displaced by fire, 11 folks ended up giving up their, their voucher um, and it took on average about three and a half months for folks to be able to find a, a new place to live once they were displaced. Citywide, um, I'm hearing a rough number of 65 units that have been lost to fire and code violations. So I don't want to be all gloom and doom here. <laughs> Um, there are great things happening in our community with regards to housing, um, so I just wanted to talk about a few of them. Um, we do have Cindy Taylor here tonight. Um, Cindy, do you want to stand up so folks can see you? <laughs> not, yeah, not um, and Cindy's, Cindy's working Line. to um, redevelop the, the old Coney um, flat iron building and we'll be uh, developing some senior housing there and uh, for those of you who have been lucky enough to um, enter her developments at Kennebec Plaza or in at City Hall they are just fall on the floor gorgeous just true examples of excellence and affordable housing so it's so exciting to see you bringing something else to the community <coughs> Amanda, I've worked so closely with the Augusta Housing Authority, and, and the, the organization has been extremely helpful at the Inn at City Hall, so I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so we also have pictured uh, here uh, Fieldstone Place Development, uh, Coney Village, which is a Bread of Life Ministries project, and... Um, the rehabilitation that took place in downtown recently um, where downtown diner is located and that was a Toby Parkhurst project. Um, so there are lots of really great things going on in our community. Um, and at this point I would be more than happy to take questions from counselors or commissioners. 
Questions? Okay. Council Byron. Uh, first question, how do you use this mic? Uh, it's, on all the it's, on all the it's on all the time. It's on yeah. all the time. All right. <laughs> Amanda, Augusta Housing has been around since, what was it, 79? Seven, yes. 79. <clears throat> and to date has only been a voucher eight <clears throat> transfer <clears throat> agency. Correct. How come? Now, I understand from my research and other housing authorities throughout the state, there are many, many other programs that a housing authority can get into as far as rehabilitating old stock and building new stock. Hasn't happened here. So my answer to that I'm not looking to point fingers, I'm yeah. just saying, are we now hopefully looking at a sea change in what you and the board will be doing with the Augusta Housing Authority? I mean, my goal for tonight is to really give the board and council an opportunity to hear about the needs in the community, and that will help them set priorities and develop initiatives moving forward. Um, so I can't speak to what's happened in the past, but I can help move things forward in a positive way going forward. Um, I, um, I think the board's really enthusiastic about hearing more about the needs in the community and, and doing whatever they can to support our mission and improving housing opportunities for low and moderate income. Well, best of luck to you and, and the board and to Augusta. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Uh, are we up ready for Margaret? If, or? if there are no more questions, yeah, then. I don't see any. <clears throat> Now introduce Margaret Bean, who's the Deputy Director of Maine State Housing Authority. Thank you, Margaret, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Amanda. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. I wish Mark, oh, Mark, you're here just in time. Thank you. The reason I wanted Mark to be here is because I wanted to talk to you about when my very first job was in Augusta. I, my very first job in 1973 was to be a teacher at Coney High School. And Mark O'Brien was one of my students. So, <laughs> Ouch. I'm, I'm, I'm dating us I'd both. I'd like to know what that says for the aging process. <laughs> I don't know what you're taking, Mark. Can you, can you I do it? want to say he was one of the best students I ever had, too, by the way. But I, I have a history in Augusta because my, my first job was here. My first apartment was here. I lived out in the Rennie Apartments out on 201 first for $155 a month. And then I moved into Crosby Street Place where I had the whole upstairs of a house for $165 a month. And when my rent went up $10, I cried and called my mother because I was, didn't know how I was going to pay the rent. And so I, those numbers have increased now, but we, I can understand how people who can't afford to pay the rent, what, the, what that stress is like. And I should also say I've also owned a home in Augusta, and my attorney, my real estate attorney is right here, Don Guild is here, so I feel very at home in, in the housing arena in this, um, in this room. So when I first started preparing for this meeting, I uh, we started. Look, I started looking at data. Like, oh, let's get let's let's get some data about Augusta. Well, then Amanda sent me her PowerPoint, where she, they have great data about Augusta already. So I would just say that you know, congratulations to Frank and Amanda. They have great data that well it agrees with ours, so it must be good. Um, and also um, that the issues in Augusta are not different from the issues elsewhere in the state of Maine. Low-income people are not making enough money to be able to afford good apartments or good first homes. So that's a problem that we face statewide. So at Maine State Housing Authority, our mission is, or our vision actually, which is shorter, is our vision is that all Maine people have the opportunity to live in quality affordable housing. So we share the, the mission of the Augusta Housing Authority um, in that we want to help low-income people be able to find and maintain affordable housing. So when I, I wanted to, let's see. Now I'm, not, I'm a little technologically challenged. Oh, perfect. So when I was gathering the numbers, I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about what Maine State Housing Authority has done in Augusta over the, the years. So this is some of it. Um, we have a program called STEP. It's, it's strengthening 
through engagement program. These are vouchers that we have targeted to homeless people. And we're working with the Bread of Life Shelter to provide services. So we actually put, we have very few of those statewide, but we put six of them in Augusta. So that brought in $16,861. Um, we've talked about the fact that Augusta Housing Authority is a, a voucher distributor uh, or, or provider. And we also have over 100 vouchers that we call port into Augusta, meaning that there are people who are on our waiting list. Like the, the state of Maine, is, pretend this is the state of Maine, there's like 27 housing authorities all over the place. And each one of them has their own jurisdiction. And so Maine State Housing Authority's jurisdiction is the spaces in between all of those where nobody is, claims the, the town. So we, um, and there's all these rules around, or we have these agreements around contiguous communities and it's all quite complicated. So we have about 100 of people who come with our funding who actually live in Augusta Housing Authority's jurisdiction. So that's over $600,000 a year in rental payments that comes through us to, uh, to people living in the Augusta area. We have the LIHE program, you've perhaps heard of that, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, which provides fuel assistance for people. And so 640 households in Augusta received $335,000 in 2013 in the LIHE program. We have a first time home buyer program. There were 16, in 2013, there were 16 people who used that program who live in, to buy houses in Augusta, which was a $1.7 million infusion. We fund homeless shelters, and this is a, like there's a little, little, very little base funding, and then there's a small amount per bed night. Now, and I just want to say that we don't come anywhere near covering the cost of what it costs to house someone in a shelter overnight, but we contribute towards that. Um, so we uh, spent for the Bread of Life shelter, and there are two shelters, $92,312 in um, 2013. And last year, uh, we allocated money toward the Coney Older Adult Project that uh, Amanda and Cindy were just referring to that, uh, that won a competition and it is going to be, we're going to be uh, subsidizing the creation of that project. Something I neglected to put on this list, because I, th I think in the last minute, and our, our slides were due yesterday at noon, so I've had thoughts since then, but um, there are several projects or developments in Augusta, they're called Section 8 projects, that HUD sends the money, the rent monies down. And so we have, um, we bring in $2.4 million per year in rental payments for those apartments as well. So there's a lot of money that flows through us to the city of Augusta to house people. And we have created 777 units in Augusta all different kinds of properties, big one, big Section 8 properties, little supportive housing properties, some as few as three and four units. But we have, we have actually built or financed 777 multifamily and supportive housing units in the city of Augusta. So when Amanda talked to me, she said, can you talk about Maine State Housing Authority's priorities? And I said, oh, that's perfect, because we just finished a strategic planning. We're in the midst of it, but we have finalized a strategic planning process. So I thought if I shared with you our program goals, those are the priorities that we have for housing in the next, it's a two-year plan, as you can see. Those, these are the, how, the priorities that we'll be working on in the next two years. <clears throat> okay, for, and this, this is our new poster. I'm trying to get up there, because I think it's fun. This is what we're trying to get our staff to do. We have limited resources, we have limited people, the problems aren't getting any better or any smaller. So we have to think differently in order to solve the problems. And Bill just said to me, you know, we've been talking about this, you know, we've, all, we've been in this business for 20 or 30 years and here we are, we're still, we have a lot of people who can't afford a, a good place to live. So we're trying to think innovatively outside the box. And if you're ever in our office, there's all these little signs all over the place, think, think yes, think outside the box. And so this is the compendium of all of them. So that's the way we're trying to approach things to just find different ways to do things and do them smarter and better. Okay, so these are the program goals that I was talking about. And just for a moment, I know that Augusta Housing Authority is starting on a uh, strategic plan. 
how, how did we do this? What did, who helped us? How did we figure out what these goals should be? So we worked with a consultant out of Bangor, actually, who did interviews with 22 of our partners, who did focus groups and hit 42 of our partners, who, did, who surveyed hundreds of our partners to get feedback on what, what are the priorities, what are the needs, what, should, what can we do to impact housing uh, in the future. So these are the, the primary goals that we came up with. This is goal number one. Improve, oh, wait a minute, I want to show you on that uh, last one. The, I call it the quizzle, the, the quizzle goals. Quality, supply, stability, and leadership. That's how we talk to staff about it. It's, the, it's, it's quizzle so that we try to get people to remember them in the order that they're in. And this is a little bit of a change because we're talking about how's improving housing quality first as opposed to creating new units. We're recognizing that we have, let's I think we have 18,600 units statewide that we have built or financed. Many of them are 30 and 40 years old and we need to spend the time, the money, the subsidy to, to keep those up to snuff, to keep them um, so that they're in good service for the people who live in them. Because if we, if we let units go offline, we can't possibly afford to build enough new ones to compensate for that. So our number one priority, which was really dictated by our board, like the, the first question one of the board members said is, well, are you taking care of the ones you have? And so it's made us really look at and, and create goals around um, um, maintaining the properties that we do have. So, we have programs, we have a 4% tax credit program to which we can use to um, improve properties. We're looking at restructuring loan agreements in uh, properties that we've already financed to keep more money in the project so there's more, more money there in their reserves so that they can do repairs when they need to be uh, done. We're looking at consolidating, improving, and expanding home repair programs. We've had some small boutique programs. We have a, a home repair program that's run by the community action agencies, which would be run by KVCAP in this area. We have an add-on to our first-time home buyer program, which is called Purchase Plus Improvement, so that somebody buying a new home can borrow some more and try to do improvements on their home. And we also have a mobile home replacement program where we've been trying to replace pre-1976 mobile homes. Those have all been kind of, you know, like just little boutique programs. So we have a new director of our energy and her housing services program. I don't know if you know Mike Barron, who used to be with the Department of Economic and Community Development. He's got a vision for what he wants to call a quality housing program, where he wants to consolidate all of those programs, consolidate all the funding resources. We're taking a look at all the regulations, and I call it concatenating the regulations, like put them all together and pull out, you know, what we actually need to the rules we need to follow so that we can put many types of funds into the same home. We don't just weatherize it. Maybe we weatherize it, we do the roof, and we replace the refrigerator or whatever the house needs, that we try to do a more comprehensive whole house approach to home repair. We want to create incentives for landlords to maintain quality rental units. I'm sure all of you are very aware of what we just went through in the past few years about some units that were substandard, as in, you're finding some of those in Augusta as well. So we want persons who, landlords who rent to housing choice vouchers, and we have 3,800 and something vouchers, so we've got a lot of landlords who work with us. We want those landlords to be incentivized to keep those units up up to speed, to, to keep it not just at the, there's a, there's a base level called holiday, housing quality standard. We want them to even be motivated to go, be, to go beyond that, to make the units nicer. So we're, and again, this is, um, we haven't figured this all out yet. We have to find the right kind of money to do this. But we want to be able to maybe make low interest loans to landlords to improve their apartments. We want, we're thinking about uh, doing some kind of um, repair reimbursement program for people who rent to our housing choice voucher recipients if they trash a unit or do some damage that we might be able to have some monies available to help with that. Now, don't hold me to this. We haven't found out the money yet, but this is what we're working. These are our stretch goals. This is what we're trying to get to. We also want to do some training and recognition for quality landlords. So to, to make it more of a... Um, 
a good thing to be a, a Section 8 landlord and not a not a bad you know, not a not you're not a slum a slum landlord if you have Section 8 vouchers that you have actually highly desirable units. We also have us we're putting together a supportive housing repair program. I talked about I think I think we have 153 supportive housing units in Augusta. So we have many all over the state which are small, they're group homes, you know, they're, they're, they're just three and four unit pr properties that were built for people with special needs. And we need to, those, as you can imagine, those units have a lot of wear and tear. A lot of times people have uh, mental illness, they, um, they, they sometimes, you know, trash the units, they sometimes make a mess, they sometimes break doors and windows. We need to have some money available to keep repairing those things because landlords can't keep up with that because, because just because of the type of tenant that it is, we need money available to help them fix things that happen in their units. So those are all things that we're trying to do to improve the quality of the housing that's already here that we have. So it's multifamily, single family, uh, rental and um, supportive housing. So a strategy in all those areas to try to improve the quality. So our next goal. Mm -hmm. If I could sing, I'd sing to you, but, oh, there we go, okay. Our next goal is to expand the supply of affordable housing. And this is always the goal. We always we know we need more. You saw in your own statistics how much more you need, and statewide it's, you know, voluminous. So, some of the strategies that we're looking to concentrate on in the next two years are number one to increase the number of first-time home buyers, keep our interest rates low, do more marketing, work with Housing Choice voucher recipients. Like Amanda's been, I know we've been in conversation about there is a a piece of the voucher program that allows voucher holders to use their voucher toward home ownership, we could be using that more robustly. We could do that. Um, we could, you gotta find quite the right person, but with the supports they need, they can um, become homeowners. This uh, re user remaining tax exempt Part E. this is a little bit of insider, I should have changed this little language here, to meet the demand for new development. The, the Part E is, um, there were $50 million of bonds that were uh, approved by the legislature two years ago. And we have $2 million left. So that's our goal to like finish it up and get, get that money used up. But we also have the 9% tax credits. We have people who are pushing to get more Part E money. So there is, there's always a need for more money to build new units. And we, we are continuing to look for that. We're looking for new resources. We're trying to work with Thame, with Efficiency Main Trust, with Rural Development, Farmers Home. We're looking at every place that we can find for new resources to try to put toward uh, new development. And one of our other goals is to develop housing options for long-term homeless in the shelters. And we'll talk a little bit more about homeless. But we, ha we need housing a person who is a long-term stayer in a homeless shelter, say over 180 days, can't just be plopped into a unit somewhere because they don't have the coping skills, they don't have the knowledge to run their own apartment, to run their own lives. So we need services to go with this housing. Main State Housing Authority's money, very, very little of it can be used for services. We can't use our money to provide the service. So we have been in long-term conversations with the Department of Human Services trying to get them to target some of their money toward these people. Now, they don't have any more money, and we don't have any more money. But we're trying to figure out how to work together, use the resources that we have better, so that we can s serve people, because they need not only housing, but they need supportive services to help them stay in that unit, whether it's case management, or it's how to get a job, how to get training, how to parent their children, how to get transportation, whatever it is, they need more than just putting them in a unit is, is going to accomplish because they can't succeed. And we've learned that, we've tried that. That's just giving them a voucher and saying, here, go find an apartment, it's not enough. Oh, time, okay, sorry. I'll hurry up. All right, all right. So the goal three, and I can stop at this goal because the rest gets a little. So this is the stability. We want to help the people who we house to stay in their housing because that's one of the problems that people cycle through and fall out the other end. 
um, I was talking about um, shelters and people who are in, in shelters. And this is a paradigm shift. We are, the more we think about it, the way the shelter funding is set up now is that people are, re shelters are paid for every bed night that people stay there. What we want to do is shift the paradigm and help shelters create resources so that we can reward them for pe getting people out of the shelter. Because we want, we want, eventually there should be no homeless shelters. I'm, in our lifetimes, that's not going to happen. But that should be the goal, that we don't <coughs> reward keeping people in shelters and we don't reward more and more bed nights. We should be, help, we should re be rewarding reduced bed nights because people are given the services and the help that they need to get out of the shelter. Another thing we're doing is we have tax credit properties that when they competed, they got points for saying that they would give a priority to a certain number of units for homeless people. And they, they don't have to, but they have to offer it. Well, when they, when they have a vacancy and they offer it, if there's no homeless person, they put somebody else in there. So what we're trying to do now is go back and we'll, we're gonna have, run a competition so that those landlords can compete for a project-based voucher, which would mean there'd be subsidy that comes with that person so that they can help them, they have their staff help that person succeed in that apartment. So we're just starting that right now. We're increasing first-time homebuyer education, how to, be a, how to be a homeowner. We're realizing that we have people who get our first-time homebuyer program. They don't have any idea about how to save money in case the roof leaks or they have a hiccup in their lives. So they need some training. So we are, our, our goal is eventually to require first-time homebuyer education for everybody, but we don't want to kill our market. We're just getting back in the market, so we don't want to do that. And the other thing is we're, we've put in some new programs to help decrease our defaults and foreclosures on single-family homes. And I'll just say we have 11,000 single-family homes in our portfolio. We're looking at a tsunami of foreclosures. We're going to have 252 foreclosures. And si only 16 of them are in Augusta, though, so that's, that's a good thing. But it is 16. There are 16. So we've put in some new uh, programs so we can defer mortgage payments and uh, write down um, mortgage rates so that people can be successful and stay in their homes. That's our goal, is to help them attain that stability in their housing, whether it's single family, multifamily, homeless, whoever it is. We want them to find the housing and be able to stay in it. And with that, I'll stop. But that's, that's, that's what we're working on. So thank you. Work is due, or anything. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else have questions? Yes, Margaret, you were talking about the, uh, <clears throat> the homeless. You're talking about Section Eight vouchers. I attended a Misha board meeting a couple yes. months ago. Yep. And I think I'm looking at my notes. I think it was Denise Lord who said that 16 counties. When you add up all those waiting for Section Eight vouchers. 10,000 people. That's correct. And you're on that list, if you stay on that list, six or seven years. I'm also told there may be some duplication in all those various lists, not just the county list, but the housing authority list too. Mm -hmm. And wasn't somebody or somebody or some group trying to merge those lists? Yes, yeah, the housing authority groups are working together to try to merge those lists. We merged ours. We had 16 county lists, now we just have one list for our portfolio, but then the housing authorities, I think it's um, Portland, South Portland, and Westbrook have merged all of theirs, and they're, once they finesse their software so they're sure it really works, they're gonna make it available to all the other housing authorities so that we can, the goal is to, at one time, sometime, have just one list so that, but it has to be a smart list because everybody's vouchers are targeted to their own areas, so they have to come off with the right funding, so. But again, if, if you're highlighting the dire circumstances this state is in mm -hmm. for affordable housing, whatever that number is, right now it's 10,000 people in the state of Maine waiting for Section 8 vouchers with a six to seven year wait time. That's right. Thank you. That's right. Yep. Good question. <clears throat> Margaret, is there some definition of the word and the term affordable housing that I may not be aware of um, in terms of within the context of your business. Your goal is to expand affordable housing. 
Um, I'm not sure what that means uh, relative to Augusta and then maybe to the state because I look at the current listings in Augusta and there are very few com communities with more affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So what is meant when you say you want to expand affordable housing? Well, and I think, are you speaking of single family homes? Is that what you're? Well, if you look at our rents, they're down too. But okay. um, if you well, look at the value of our rental properties, they're not high and they're not gaining equity. So mm -hmm. I'm just trying to say what the term means. So, you know, do we want more $40,000 homes? Well, as far as rental goes, affordable means that the family has to pay no more than 30% of their income toward their rent. So it really is dependent upon the family involved. So what's affordable to them? So we're looking at low-income people and trying to create housing. And you're, you're right, in, in the general market, Augustus rents may be reasonable and their house prices may be reasonable, but we're looking at a, a low-income tier and we're, we're trying to create housing that they only have to pay 30% of their income to support. Can I just speak to that too? Yeah, person? please. So, um, and one of the slides that's in that handout also speaks to that where it's true that the the monthly, the median monthly rent in Augusta is much lower than it is in Kennebec County or Maine. The median home price is much lower, um, but the median income is much lower here too. So the affordability is still an issue because even though the rental amount is less and the home purchase price is less, people can't afford it because they're not making as much as they're making in other communities, the people that live here. Right, I, I, I do have a number on that. So overall, the home ownership index for Augusta is 1.18, so meaning that someone who has a typical income can afford just a little over, can afford a house. And the rent of the, uh, let's see, the opposite is true for rental properties where the index for 2012 was 0.97, meaning that the, this typical renter could not afford an apartment in Augusta. So it's, it's, about, it's about the income of the person we're trying to house as much as it is about the amount of rent or the home price. Does that, does that make sense? Totally. Um, I mean, it makes sense in the sense that you've cleared up what, what you mean by it. I, I'm not, I can't maybe claim that it makes sense that we need to do it this way. And, I'm, and that'd be like commentary probably for brainstorming. Okay. Is to slow this down and start talking outside the box? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, Cecil. Hi, thank you. Uh, I want to go back to the business about the homeless shelters and uh, social service interface. And can you? I know that the VA is doing some work with uh, mm -hmm. Mental Life, and I suspect that that's probably fairly strong in terms of the model. Uh, is that a weakness, though, in other areas, say adult protective services and the homeless that are in shelters? Is there a is there some problem there or some interface issues? I, I th and I know you have shelter people here who will probably speak t in more detail to this. I think we have difficulty, back in the 90s, human services attached their services to, to certain groups and to certain homes. So they would say to us, we've got six kids with cerebral palsy who are living in New Hampshire. We want to bring them home, build us a building, and we'll support them in that or we've got four brain injured people and we want them to, to live in Augusta, build a house and we'll put them there. Well, there's been a sea change at Human Services so that the services are delivered, they're, they're community, they want people in the community, they don't want them to be housed together so that they don't support housing uh, people with disabilities together. So they're all spread out so that it bec you can say there's a problem, but it's just, they would say it's not a problem, it's just the way they do business. But it makes it hard when you're trying to link housing to services when they don't see that as a, a link. They, they see the link between the person and their service provider, not the housing. Okay, well, you brought that up and I was just curious as to whether or not that's something that uh, you want to continue with because uh, we know that when people come into, say, the warming center, uh, that becomes a social club, but it also is an opportunity for people to be uh, inter, uh, well, the adults of protection sure. services to make that contact. Yep. So you've already identified them. We are in the process of identification, uh, but I've just you you brought it up, and I was just curious as to how you've linked that, or what you're going to do with that going well, forward. Well, we, well, we're meeting once a month with Mary Mayhew and her staff to try to find ways to to link those back together. 
okay. that still work with their rules. Fine. <clears throat> Other questions over here? Okay, thanks, thanks Margaret. Um, just to, uh, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Frank O'Hara, and I'm going to help facilitate uh, the remaining part of the session. We've just heard some general presentations from Amanda and from Margaret. Now we're going to go into a little more detail into some uh, uh, the homeless issues, the single family home market, and city policies, neighborhood goals, and so forth. And then there will be a chance for the council and board to talk, and then for the general public to get involved as well. And I want to introduce Dean Lachance, who's going to speak a little about homeless and special needs. Dean is some of the conscience of Central Maine with regards to housing. And looking up his background, I noticed he had kind of unusual background for a shelter operator. It wasn't your standard social work kind of background. He was the IT chief for Unum for the Northeast for 10 years. But, but he, now he's found chief. a new... Not the big chief. <laughs> now he's got a new occupation. <laughs> There is a way it can go on, but you're the IT guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably why he changed careers. <laughs> and, uh, I think you got it, uh, Dean, if you can just uh, focus it on. Focus on it. But they keep telling me focus. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's got a hand out. There should be enough for everybody. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be with you, Augusta Housing folks, because Augusta Housing is one of our primary partners in trying to solve housing challenges within the city of Augusta. Our other four major partners are Maine Housing, <coughs> HUD, City of Augusta, and the VA. Amanda was kind enough to uh, invite me and also was kind enough to give me six particular bullets that I should answer. So here we go. A quick snapshot of Bread of Life's role in the housing community. We provide two homeless shelters, one for families and one for veterans. The family shelter is, is partially funded through funds through everything from United Way to individual and corporate donations and funds from Maine Housing and the federal government through the Emergency Solutions Grant. The veterans shelter, which is unique in Maine, partnering with the VA is 100% funded in services by the VA. We currently have 84 apartments in Augusta. We started housing in the year 2000, and those uh, are primarily for people coming out of homelessness or challenging situations. We work closely with the co-occurring disorders court, the prison, the CARA program, uh, folks coming out of a variety of situations, and certainly coming out of the shelters. 23 of our units are at the Lawrence House, which is a lodging home. A lodging facility is defined by the state of Maine. It's similar to a motel with particular rules and regulations. And we have folks there who pay in advance for a week or a month at a time. That facility in January became a dry facility. I believe it's the only dry facility in the city. It is uh, meaning drugs and alcohol are not allowed in the facility. Certainly drugs never were. But now we've added alcohol to that. And uh, it allows us to evict people if we find use of alcohol. We found there was a huge need for people to have a dry facility in the city of Augusta as they were coming out of difficult situations and they were on probation, they wanted to live in a house that was uh, alcohol free. We have 16 units that are transitional housing units. Transitional housing units are defined by HUD to be a facility in which you have a maximum stay of two years and you have a lease <coughs> while you're there, just like if it was your apartment and you'd pay approximately 33, 30 to 33%. The rest are permanent housing apartments with yearly leases. We do have some project-based vouchers. This is a voucher subsidy that comes with the property, which is different than a Section 8 voucher, which moves with the person. So we, we provide services to both types of individuals, those who need a voucher and come into our properties and utilize our property-based vouchers, or people who come with a, their own voucher, which may come from Augusta Housing or Maine Housing, typically Augusta Housing, and uh, utilize our facilities. We also have people who come into our properties and just rent a unit. We recently purchased the Shelley Rose property next to our soup kitchen, uh, and we've just finished renovating the second and third floor and in the process of filling those units. They're actually really gorgeous, and they're priced amazing, uh, and they're very large and bright with a great view of the, of the uh, river. We'd love to have more project-based vouchers. 
uh, as there's a huge one and a half, two year waiting list for, for non-project based vouchers. Uh, so it would be much easier to house people if we had vouchers associated with our properties versus people coming with them because most people have a challenge getting those. Specific information relating to community needs. Homeless needs do have a sense of unmet need in the community and, and all the demographics around us. So shelters are always full. There's no additional funding. In fact, funding for shelters from the federal government have decreased at least 10 straight years. In 1984, there were eight shelters in Maine. This year, there's 43 shelters in Maine. Bed night funding for shelters in Maine in 1984 was approximately $33 per bed night funded. Per, a bed night is a person in a bed per night. Funding now through federal and state funding services per bed night is approximately $10.33. So demand is up, the challenging needs of the individuals is up, but the ability to fund people coming into shelters is, is much more difficult on all the nonprofits in Maine who have shelters. We're working right now very closely with Maine Housing and the Maine State Homeless Council for options regarding operational funding for shelters in Maine. There's a committee we've met once. We have two more scheduled meetings in the next month. We're trying to figure out if there's a way to have baseline operational funding and additional funding that would be incentive-based in order to move people along in an appropriate, self-sufficient way, and that would be incentive funding in addition to operational funding. This will likely take a while, but shelters are hurting for funds without a doubt, and HUD's philosophy is to move people toward rapid rehousing for the homeless with the goal of the sooner they're out into an apartment and the sooner they get services, the quicker homelessness can be solved. With limited vouchers, this has had limited success throughout Maine. <clears throat> Transitional housing is, is right in the middle of changing priorities nationwide. Transitional housing being that program where you can stay for up to two years and you're between a shelter bed and being in a permanent housing unit. Transitional housing is basically being done away with and so there's no new properties being funded for transitional housing unless it's for domestic violence or for veterans where they found pretty good success for use of transitional housing. Uh, for current projects, we have 16 units of transitional housing they are looking to lose our funding, which is a nationwide trend, and we are encouraged to move those properties from transitional housing designation to permanent supportive housing. There are challenges with that, but we're working right now with Maine Housing and HUD in trying to solve how we can transition in a healthy way, both for our clients and both for uh, financial uh, appropriateness. Permanent rental housing the well, big, biggest issue we see is many units in Augusta are being shut down. You've got some statistics regarding that. We've housed people coming through GA who uh, went through fire situation or uh, got kicked out because of code violations of their landlord. So we work closely with the local housing organizations to see when they have a need, if we might have an opening in some of our properties. And uh, that's actually working really well the last six to 12 months. In uh, It's a great <clears throat> partnership. Eventually, the number of units available would be none. <laughs> and there'll be more people losing their housing in Augusta because of code violations. Consequently, there'll be some more abandoned buildings. There's, there's landlords, uh, less landlords taking vouchers because there's a very strict right criteria in the last 12 months regarding inspections. Augusta Housing and Maine Housing appropriately are, are strict with their inspections, more strict in the last 12 months, and that's causing, uh, that's causing uh, challenges to landlords who either can't afford to upgrade their properties, so less of them are going to be taking people with vouchers. We do have a partnership with Coney Village that was mentioned earlier that uh, we do with KV Cap. KV Cap's been a great project partner with us, as has the city of Augusta. Basically what we have there is 43 units of new housing potential, 11 of which have been built on. This has been an enormously challenging project because our entire infrastructure was in place at the same time the 2008 market crash hit. So we were trying to build new homes just when everything was falling apart. So that, that has been slowed down significantly. 
Uh, prices and appraisals continue to be low. Sales are just starting to see an increase. And we learned that we had to go after grants to help a specific demographic. So we created a project for veterans who were disabled or in need to get housing that could be affordable and accessible. Fortunately, we were able to obtain a $125,000 grant from Home Depot and another $200,000 CDBG grant, which is Community Development Block Grant, in partnership with the City of Augusta and state and federal sources. So we've finished two of those homes and we hope to build another 18 that, that will allow for a significant uh, affordable range of brand new accessible housing for veter veterans who are disabled or in need. So based on our experience, what's the largest unmet need with housing in the landscape of Augusta? I, I think a nice solution would be more lodging facilities like our Lawrence House, safe, clean, dry, affordable, for people coming out of challenging situations where they pay by the week or the month. Um, we found that hugely successful. It works very well for people coming out of prison, people coming out of um, a variety of other situations, and uh, the city has been a great <coughs> asset in working with us in the GA program for short and or long-term housing, housing needs. I'd be welcome to answer any questions. Okay, good. Questions? Uh, yeah. uh, hi, Dean. Uh, the question, you said before that you would like to get out of the shelter business and, and move to transition and beyond, and uh, that, that hasn't changed in your mind, has it, that you would like to move beyond the shelter? I, I don't see in our grandchildren's lifetime shelters going away. Um, I would but, like, what I'd like to see is people moving out of the shelter sooner with quicker solutions, but there's... Uh, as one of our previous speakers said, there's a, there's a period amount of time in which clients need to settle out of the trauma that they're going through in homelessness where they can get evaluated for their mental health, physical health, housing needs, employment needs, children's needs, and that, that takes more than 30 days. And so there's always a need to have a place in which can be safe and clean and appropriate for people to go. And today, there's, that's a humus, very important to have our shelter safety net in place. The challenge is our funding sources are... This is a political, maybe it's a political question. What's driving the uh, uh, drying up of funds from HUD in terms of transitional housing? Is it sequester? Uh, it no, it's, 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 more, it's more, I think it's more philosophy-based regarding uh, what they've seen as successful use of transitional housing has been, has been more particularly based on specific types of groups and so they'd rather see permanent supportive housing for when people coming out of the shelter, instead of going into a transitional mode, having more of a permanent mode. So um, that's, that's the movement based you, on the data you, that they have. Yeah, how do you see that working? Is that going to work? Is that, is that realistic? <clears throat> I'm not sure it's going to make much different from our perspective. Uh, once they get into a housing and they have a lease, whether it be permanent or transitional, it's, they still have a house, they still have an apartment, they still pay rent. A certain percent. Um, the challenge with the model going from transitional permanent supportive services, permanent supportive services requires services that aren't necessarily funded in the new model. So the desire to change the model before funding is available is, is what's challenging most of our housing organizations in Maine. So does this come back to uh, uh, social services and the impact again? Is this another piece where you... Oh, I would, yeah. I would, yeah. I would say so, yeah. Okay, thanks. How does it make a difference to people? To, how does all this housing fit into the people getting their lives back together? Sure. I'll give you a generic and a, and a specific example. Generic is, we're fortunate because my predecessors had a greater vision that we could have a continuum of care of services in Augusta. So we have food and shelter, transitional housing, permanent housing, case management services, a donation center, a center for education for life skills, uh, the opportunity to move beyond with the supportive services around it. So that's in place. Uh, so that's kind of the general model, which we think is a very powerful and supportive, successful model. If people work with us, we can help them mm -hmm. move out of the challenging situations that they're in. Mm -hmm. per, uh, a specific example, a um, lot of veteran examples of, we've processed 150 people in two and a half years going through. Uh, these are mostly single male veterans coming out of our shelter, uh, all of which but 
five or six have gone on to housing mm -hmm. and stability and some kind of inf income source and healthcare services. Mm -hmm. um, a family situation, living in a home that got shut down because of code violations, or home ownership, uh, burning trash to stay warm, bringing in ice to flush the toilet, just horrific situations, one meal a day for a teenage girl. Mom and daughter have special needs. Come into our shelter, her, her world's changed in the sense that she has a hot shower every day and a, her own bed and all the safetyness that goes with that and friends helping her and her high school career flourishes and they now live in their own home in a different town from here uh, and doing very well. That's, that's the goal of self-sufficiency and moving folks out of traumatic times into um, reintegration and success in the community. Okay. Healthy okay. success. Thanks. Liz? Oh. Okay. Frank, can, can you tell us about residential sprinklers and ground light buildings? Uh, I believe that some of the buildings that you've retrofitted here in the city of Augusta have sprinkler systems in them. Yeah, good question. Is, 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 Often is, is uh, the question is, do we have sprinkler systems in our buildings? And his understanding is some of the buildings that we've retrofitted with help from HUD and main housing funding and private and public grants, um, our goal is to always have uh, as many sprinkler systems in our properties as can because it's the safest situation. So many of our properties do. Some of them still don't. We'd love to have a nice donor or a grant come along and <laughs> put the rest of the sprinkler systems in. Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks. Do, do, could I? Next. Try? Yes. One more. See some. Yeah. That brings up another point that was brought to my attention by someone who knows <coughs> very much about HUD programs, and that has to do with the ability of loan funds or loan grant funds or something from HUD to help landlords uh, improve properties. Is that a realistic uh, approach to go, and how hard is that to get there? It's complicated, but it works. There are 30 units on Sewell Street that we took over about seven years ago. They were called Arch Alpha. They're now called Westman Village. Those 30 units were in huge disrepair, and through cooperation with main housing funds and HUD housing funds, we have completely renovated those properties and turned that neighborhood significantly into a healthy neighborhood serving families um, with really, really nice apartments. Could this work down to, say, a landlord that doesn't have a lot of um, properties? Is it, how, is it limited to a fairly non large number of units? Usually those RFP funds come out for people who are nonprofit organizations. So landlords who don't necessarily work in the nonprofit world like we do, uh, it's, 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 I don't know if it's possible, but if it is, it's probably a little more complicated. Is that something that maybe could be looked into. We've had this conversation before, and I've asked... Augusta Housing would fit into that model. Yes. That's something you might want to put on the... On the, on the table for the Augusta Housing Authority Board. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, thanks, Dean. We're going to just have the council with the questions and the boards and later a chance to talk. Yeah. Now, the next speaker is Perry McCourtney, and Perry is somebody who grew up in the area, went to Halldale High School, went off to Wisconsin, made, made his fortune, and now is back working at Sprague and Curtis Real Estate Agency, and he's going to talk about single-family homes. You may have to share. My comments will be brief. Um, I have uh, been given bullet points by Amanda, um, and I am Perry McCourtney. It's nice to be here. Um, I am born and brought up in the area. I moved uh, when I graduated from high school. Um, I went to University of Southern Maine, got my undergrad, and then went to University of Wisconsin to get my graduate degree, thinking I would be there for two years, and I was there 22. Not all in my graduate degree. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, my motto is life happens when you're planning something else. And so I had a thriving business, four thriving restaurants in Madison. And two years ago, my mom called and said um, my dad was ill with Alzheimer's and she needed my help. And so what do you do? And so uh, what you do is you do the right thing and you move home. And it's um, liberating. It's scary. And... When you wake up in the morning after you've done all that, you're like, wow, I can do anything. So it's really, really great to be back. Um, I love being back in my community. I've never lived somewhere where I can go to the grocery store and see someone I went to high school with. 
It's just really great. And I'm also really happy to be with Sprague and Curtis. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about the housing market. Um, Amanda gave me some bullet points. Um, she wanted to know what typical buyers are looking for and if Augusta is meeting those needs. Um, and I have lots of data for you. <clears throat> buyers are as unique as the communities that are around us. Um, each community, um, it, it, our buyers look at neighborhoods. They look at uh, whether they want an in-town feeling, an urban feeling, or a rural setting. Augusta offers all of those, in, and including waterfront. Um, my clients that are looking specifically in Augusta are looking for convenience to services, amenities. The new hospital is a fabulous um, addition to that. Um, I'm working specifically with clients, elderly, the baby boomers, as you noted uh, previously. Um, I think that there's a need for in-town living, no stairs, um, close to public transit. Um, I have clients right now willing and able to buy, and we can't find something. In that, in that segment of the market. Um, as baby boomer, boomers age, um, proximity to amenities, services are increasing. Um, I think the area that probably Augusta lacks the most is moderate to high income housing. When you look at um, some of the previous slides that Amanda shared, there really hasn't been any huge development in Augusta since the 70s, you know, with Ganniston, et cetera. Um, we do have some new development with Coney Village, which I'm a part of. Fieldstone Place, um, and Fieldstone has some, what I consider a moderate to high income, which is over $300,000 in a purchase price of a home. Um, but overall, in that segment, from the 80s on, most like across America, people were moving to the suburbs. People were moving out, um, Chelsea, Sydney, you'll see a lot more um, new development. There's plenty of options for low or moderate income buyers. 85% 80 of all of our sales are under $175,000 per unit. Um, great options in the Augusta area. Um, Dean had talked about Coney Village. Um, Multifamilies, <coughs> Amanda had asked me about multiple family sales. They're, they mirror single family sales and their needs, and I guess um, the biggest the biggest need that my clients and most clients of realtors look for are um, stability of neighborhood and protection of schools. I think people want to see um, infrastructure, they want to see improvements, they want to see good zoning, and they want to see good schools. So what I have for data is uh, the single family sales in Kennebec County um, for 2013 You'll see it spiked in 2007 at 177,000 was the um, average. And um, we're creeping back up. Sales are up, which is great. Uh, last year it was 151,000. And then specifically for single family homes in Augusta, we had 162 units last year. And that averaged 116,000 um, in sales. And then I also broke down for the historical data by different um, um, communities, Belgrade, Chelsea, China, Dresden, to see the percentage of sales. Um, so sales volume is up, which is good. Um, prices are up a little, <laughs> not as much. I, I have clients that call me and say, USA Today says, you know, prices are up 17%. Well, yes. It, Prices are up maybe in Los Angeles or maybe in Boston, maybe in Portland, but real estate's a local market. Um, we supply continues to um, uh, outdo demand, so uh, we still have a lot of foreclosures. Uh, once the foreclosures, we are approaching the final wave of foreclosures, um, then we'll see prices start to rise even more. My prediction is that we'll see prices go up three to 5% over the next five to 10 years. We've always been an area of slow and steady. We haven't had the high highs and the low lows. It's just kind of slow and steady. We have very stable employers. Um, so that's what I have for you. Questions? Questions for Perry? Any surprises there? Yes? Uh, question. Uh, is there a reluctance by the uh, developers to build speculatively? Um, certainly, yes. Um, in, once 2008 hit, 
people don't, didn't want to uh, put a lot of money into speculative building. It's more custom building at this point. So Fieldstone is a custom built Correct. situation. They Correct. buy the property, somebody's interested, they'll, Correct. they'll buy the house. The developer will put money into the infrastructure mm -hmm. as far as the underground utilities, the roads, et cetera, mm -hmm. which is significant. Mm -hmm. And then the homes itself is custom. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, Dave. Thank you. Um, Dave Rollins, City Council. Mm -hmm. Didn't identify myself the first time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, you, you have a demand for um, a certain segment of housing, um, moderate and high end, you call them. Mm -hmm. As a professional um, here in front of the City Council and the Housing Authority, but more directed to the, what can we do as the city to attract more development in that segment of housing? Um, I think that you're doing what you can at this point with Fieldstone, and I think that that segment is a small segment of the market. Um, and, and it is as unique as the buyer is as far as what their needs are. Um, you just Maybe have to the high end is, but the moderate range, what, what, what kind of pr housing prices are you talking about when you say moderate? Um, between 100 and 150. Yeah. So you think there's an opportunity for developers to develop homes in that price range in Augusta? Certainly. Uh, I think that there's opportunity in every segment. We have that at Coney Village. Our Coney Village three bedroom, two bath <coughs> is 147.9. That's a great option for a first time home buyer. We've had a hard time with that development as Dean talked about because um, that got up and running right when the market went down. Um, it's back on the upswing. <coughs> I just would like to somehow start getting the word out to developers that, you know, there is a demand here as presented by the real estate professionals. Sure. Buyers express an interest. Um, build it and they will come. Right. And, and like I said also, um, I see a need for um, smaller units, condominiums, no stairs, elevators, um, barrier-free living f for seniors that want to be in town, want to have a more urban feeling, um, close to amenities. There's a need. And that would, that would help a lot of some of the statistical analysis mm -hmm. we look at. If we can get people in the middle. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, just, Perry, I was going to ask a follow-up to Dave's, which is he talked about new construction. How about in the existing home market in the neighborhoods that exist here now? Are there things that you think about the city could be thinking about in terms of helping the value of those homes by neighborhood? I think the biggest thing is zoning. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing is to protect that neighborhood's character and charm mm -hmm. and to uh, continue to improve infrastructure. Okay. All right. That's Cecil. what I hear from my yes. clients all the time. Yes. Cecil did. With the growing elderly group, which a lot of us are in, uh, the transport, <laughs> yeah, the trans yes. speak for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. The <laughs> transportation <laughs> problems that we face in the valley are significant. Uh, this is a large, spread out geographical area. So what you're telling us is, is that those folks are looking for something in town where there is a bus, where they can walk, correct? Correct. Yeah, so that there's no real interest in them living out in the woods and the correct. bushes, so to correct. speak. And some of them drive, but they don't want to drive long distances. They don't want to drive in bad weather. Yeah, okay. Yep, thanks. Cindy, I think, Cindy, you had a question. Uh, Repeat the question for the um, team. Uh, uh, the question was asked, how many homes do we have on the market currently in $120,000? Right. I, I don't know what's on the market currently. We have 356 houses um, currently listed at my agency. I don't know where they fall. I would say um, probably 30% of that number. Mm -hmm. I, I was just... I was thinking of your uh, comment about what, as we age, as our state ages, in, in what um, buyers are looking for. Mm -hmm. And we saw back in the 70s and 80s the tendency to leave the service centers, to leave the urban areas, to go out into the rural areas, to have, you know, the three or four, ten acres, sure. uh, and then, you know, drive into the service centers. That still happens uh, uh, today, of course, but obviously it's an opportunity 
What you're describing is an opportunity for Augusta, mm -hmm. where people want to be close to services, mm -hmm. want to be closer to an urban area, do not want to commute you know, long distances to go to the grocery store. So I see this as really an opportunity over the next 10 to 15 years that Augusta is, is sort of uniquely positioned uh, to take advantage of. Absolutely, especially with the new hospital. Okay. Thanks, thank, thank you, Perry. Thank you. Matt Nazar and Rob Overton are now going to give the presentation from the city policies point of view. I'm definitely not going to have enough uh, handouts, but I will pass some along and we'll see how far they go. I'm Matt Nazar. I'm the Director of Development Services for the City of Augusta. Um, my department uh, has a number of bureaus in it that are relevant to this particular discussion. We've got the Economic Development Bureau, uh, the Planning Bureau, uh, and the Code Enforcement Bureau. Uh, so those three in particular, and there's a few more in the department, but those three in particular I think are, are relevant to uh, the discussion this evening and the sort of things that have been going on uh, in the city of Augusta with regard to housing. Uh, uh, Amanda did ask me to talk about uh, policy and, and uh, what has occurred here at the city level. Uh, what's been occurring over the course of the last uh, 12 to 18 months in, in that neighborhood and uh, where the city is headed uh, or where, where we believe we may be headed. Uh, I'd say, first of all, what I've, what I've handed out to you is, uh, is a single page, and I've already given it to the folks up at the table, so it's on, your, it's on the table in front of you. Uh, in addition to that, I've also left uh, on the table, out, on the, out in the hallway, and on the table for the folks up, uh, up front, a copy of uh, U.S. Census Bureau data, it's just some information so that you folks have some, some solid data right in front of you on, with regard to housing occupancy and units uh, in the city of Augusta. The one-pager is from the city's comprehensive plan. Um, this is a comprehensive plan that was done uh, in 2005-2006 uh, and adopted by city council, uh, actually 2006-2007, adopted by city council uh, in uh, uh, January of 2008. The comprehensive plan is essentially the policy document uh, for a large overarching policy document for the city council and the city of Augusta. It addresses just about anything that you could possibly want to talk about in the city of Augusta with regard to transportation, housing, population, schools, <coughs> all of that. The one pager that I've given you um, is a one page policy section. There's a bunch of data in the comprehensive plan as well, but this is the policy section with regard to housing. Uh, and it talks about some of the things that the city is interested in doing over the course of about the 10-year life of the comprehensive plan. So we're about six to seven years in. We're a little more than halfway into uh, to what is the typical life expectancy of the comprehensive plan. Uh, talks about developing new residential housing uh, in, urban, in urban densities. The city of Augusta obviously is an urban service center community. It has a completely different set of uh, uh, development patterns than you see uh, elsewhere in our surrounding communities. Much more densely compacted. Um, and in addition to that, um, a very different housing mix. We've already heard uh, some of the discussion of the housing mix in the city of Augusta, but I think it's important to, to weave some of the things together that we've heard. 53% of the homes in the city of Augusta are owner-occupied. 47% are renter-occupied, the residential units. So that, that's very different from what you see in surrounding communities. Surrounding communities, the numbers are closer to 80 or 90% owner-occupied and 20, 10 to 20% renter-occupied. Um, so there's a very different set of, of um, issues that arise uh, when you're talking about a, a large uh, renter population and a large landlord population than you get if it's essentially all owner-occupied in your community. Um, those challenges are multiplied when you're talking about a housing stock that is, uh, is uh, aging rapidly. Uh, when half of your housing stock is at least 50, 50 to 55 years old and a third of your housing stock is more than 75 years old, yet your rents, as we've heard this evening, are low, um, it proves difficult for landlords to be able to maintain buildings um, and for renters to continue to pay rent uh, in the economy that we've had over the course of the last five to six to seven years. The cost of oil has gone up. 
the cost of, of maintaining your properties has gone up just by the nature of the economy. Uh, the cost of goods and materials, if you're going to buy a two by four in, in, uh, for a house in Manchester or a two by four for a triple decker here in Augusta, it costs the same. Um, but unfortunately, the amount of rent that you may be getting from a single family home if you're renting it or even a, a duplex or something like that in Manchester is going to likely be significantly higher um, than you might get from a residential unit in a triple decker here in Augusta. So those are some of the challenges I think that landlords are facing and that the community is facing um, uh, from the perspective of uh, the quality of housing and the ability of, of owners and renters uh, to continue to, uh, to maintain those buildings. That has been reflected, I'm sure, as many of you have seen in newspaper articles um, over the last 18 months uh, with my department, in particular uh, the code enforcement office, where um, uh, our code enforcement officers have gone into buildings based on largely calls um, from, uh, from residents, uh, renters in the buildings. In some cases, they have gone into those buildings because uh, it's been obvious as they've driven past them that there have been concerns about the buildings. Uh, but as they've gone into them, uh, they've discovered uh, that in many cases there are very, very significant uh, safety violations or safety concerns for residents, and in some cases very significant, um, uh, very significant health concerns uh, with, regard, with regard to the buildings. Rob can talk uh, in more detail about some of the things he's observed uh, over the course of the last 18 months, and, uh, and the results have been that in many cases, um, We've been able to work with landlords and been able to lower work with property owners to address uh, the situations that they've had in their buildings um, with, with life safety codes, uh, the issues of, of um, uh, egress in particular for buildings and being able to get out of buildings safely, meeting uh, the code standards. Uh, but in some cases, we have had to, unfortunately, uh, close a number of buildings uh, until they were uh, brought to code standards. Importantly, the, the city hasn't condemned uh, the buildings. These are not buildings that are in danger of falling down or present a safety hazard to people just simply walking by. Um, they are buildings that are simply uh, do not meet life safety codes or do not meet uh, health standards uh, through our general assistance uh, office uh, and health officer uh, going into the buildings and taking a look at what's in the buildings and have unfortunately had to have been uh, closed uh, and not not remained occupied while they're uh, either hopefully while they're renovated and, and uh, reconstructed uh, and in some cases unfortunately uh, where the landowner has has simply walked away from the buildings or appears to have at this point. Uh, the newspaper articles uh, have have identified I think the numbers and I and uh, just to be clear we do have about 65 units that we've ended up having to um, uh, to uh, have no longer occupied, and it ends up being about 12 buildings. Uh, that is a small number of the buildings that the city has gone through. City Council, I think, has been very supportive of that, uh, that effort by the Code Enforcement Office and by the Fire Department in particular. Um, I think the Fire Chief uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, instrumental uh, in the issue of safety within these buildings because of his concern for obviously the residents within the buildings, uh, but in addition to that, his concern for the safety of uh, his personnel and his staff uh, that end up going into many of these buildings on a, on a uh, regular basis for emergency calls. Um, obviously, he has paramedics that go in on a much more regular basis uh, than firefighters with respect to dealing with fire calls, uh, but in either case, uh, there needs to be a situation when, uh, when the firefighters get into the buildings or the paramedics get into the buildings that is safe for them. Uh, and if it's safe for them, then it's going to end up being safe for the residents as well. Uh, that's been something that has been difficult, I think, like I say, for landlords to, uh, to address because of the economy and, and what has occurred over the last four to five years. If you take a look at, at that one pager um, from the comprehensive plan, I, I thought it was actually uh, very telling as, we were re as I was reading the last paragraph in, in the second column. It talks about the positive side of higher rents uh, that were occurring in 2006, 2007, uh, that it would allow landlords to fix up their properties, the negative side being that it might displace some lower income tenants, uh, but that the situation would be, uh, would be more difficult uh, uh, going forward. What, what I found a bit ironic was that unfortunately, 
one year after this was adopted, um, that situation turned around significantly and the ability of landlords to take care of 100-year-old buildings to heat, in many cases uninsulated buildings, uh, became significantly more difficult uh, as, as rents were no longer able to go up uh, uh, and be able to keep tenants. So from the perspective of that type of, of lower income housing, that's some of the challenges uh, that they think that the city of Augusta has been facing. Certainly the, uh, the city council has been very supportive of, uh, of uh, the code enforcement office and the fire department working with the general assistance office uh, and working with the state fire marshal's office uh, to identify, and of course working with the Augusta Housing Authority to identify those situations and work with landlords to correct them. Uh, in addition to that, we've also, of course, heard about a lot of the other uh, uh, things that the city of Augusta has been working on uh, from a policy perspective to try and increase or, or uh, improve housing quality within the, uh, within the city of Augusta. We've worked closely with uh, Cindy on, on the Coney uh, Flatiron Project. We've worked uh, closely with uh, Dean on the Coney Village Project and, of course, all of the other ones that have been mentioned this evening. Uh, Going forward, I think that some of the bigger issues uh, are going to be uh, uh, with respect to some of the, the higher end properties and, and trying to um, uh, better understand the market for those and then working with uh, the existing housing stock uh, and the quality of that housing stock and the ability of residents, <laughs> both owners and renters and landlords, uh, to be able to afford to maintain and upgrade those. Um, I, I, like I say, I, I heard uh, I heard loud and clear the 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 questions with respect to well, prices are lower, so shouldn't it be more affordable? But unfortunately, that that also uh, has an impact on the ability of people to be able to maintain quality housing. Um, and and uh, like I say, Rob is here to talk about some of the things that he has experienced with regard to the homes. If uh, if the council would like to, or council and and uh, and board would like to hear what some of those conditions have been, uh, and what he looks at when he walks into a property, um, I think he, that that might be uh, uh, might be illuminating. Uh, because I'll be honest with you, um, I have not. Uh, I, I've been very, very, very surprised um, at some of the photographs and some of the stories. Uh, that have come back uh, to my office uh, from Rob uh, and from the fire department uh, as to the conditions of some of these some of these buildings. Um, it is it is not something that uh, you expect to see uh, in in a, a beautiful community like the city of Augusta. Matt, before, before you go, any, any yes. For Matt? Before Rob gets up. Matt, a quick question for you is that Perry, if Perry uh, is looking for land that he can, that would have a nice view of the river and it flat and would ha have a yeah, high density. Yeah, we've got just the piece for him. It's okay. just amazing. Okay, well, yeah, <laughs> go speak to him afterwards. Okay, <laughs> Rob. Hello, uh, my name is Rob Overton. I'm a code enforcement officer with the city of Augusta. Um, I think it's we've established uh, that you know the, the the housing stock in Augusta is is very old. Um, when we we take a building that was built in the early 1900s, um, long before the existence or the adoption of any of the the building and life safety codes that we that we have today, um, combine that with with um, years of neglect, um, and, you, and you you've got a, a recipe for um, very dangerous situations. Um, you know we're we're, we're finding many, many buildings that we are going into um, are, are entirely uh, substandard um, as, as far as the, the, the life safety code um, applies to them. Buildings that do not have adequate uh, safe means for the tenants to escape in emergencies um, are, are lacking adequate smoke detection um, and, and a, a lot of work that's been performed in these buildings is, is substandard. Um, it's, it's being performed by unlicensed personnel, uh, in many cases in, a, in, a, in an effort for the landlord to, um, to save money uh, rather than paying an electrician or a plumber, he attempts to do it himself. And in many cases it creates a, um, a, an increased uh, dangerous situation. 
um, we're, we're, we're finding that the tenants in these buildings are, are very aware of the problems but feel that they have no other options, uh, so they remain there. We, we've we found that we've, in, in some of the buildings that we've closed, we've displaced tenants on more than one, one occasion, um, which is, is discouraging because we, we, we we're hoping to move the tenant into a safer situation only to find that they've moved into a situation that's um, as dangerous as where they were, if not more dangerous. Um, and, and we're finding many different attitudes among the property owners. Um, one common uh, theme there, though, is the inability to, to fix the buildings because of the, the cost. Uh, you know, when, when you're, we're talking about inadequate means of egress from a third story of a building, that's not a, that's not a simple or, or inexpensive fix. In, in many cases, you're, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars uh, to, to provide egress to a single unit. Um, many of the landlords we're dealing with bought their buildings in 2005, 2006, 2007, where they, and where they, they paid a, a premium for these buildings. Um, and they simply have no means to fix these buildings up. So we're, we're going in, we're identifying these problems, um, and, and in very few instances thus far are, are we seeing those, those problems corrected. Um, and, and as Matt, Matt pointed out, in, in some of the, the instances we've, we've found conditions that were so dangerous, we, we, we decided that the, the best course of action was to remove the tenant. Um, I'd, I'd love to say that um, you know, we, we've got over the, the initial um, hump and, and are, are headed in, uh, uh, that the housing stock is better now than it was 18 months ago, but I, I, unfortunately that's not the case. Um, we, I'd also love to say we're, we, won't, we won't be closing down any more buildings, but I doubt that's true as well. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. My, my job in this is easy. Um, I point out the problem. Um, I, I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't offer the solutions. Um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what else to, to say about the. Let's see, let's see some questions. Uh, questions for Rob? <laughs> Any surprises here from what, what Rob's saying? Yes, go ahead. Identify yourself. I'm Sue Page. I'm on the Augusta Housing Board. I worked for the City Tax Assessor's Office for 32 years, retiring in 2006. You're right. These people came from out of state, 2005, 2006, and paid premiums for these big, junky buildings. They were paying twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a unit. We were falling off our chairs in the assessor's office. We couldn't believe it. It's very similar to somebody buying a single family home. Didn't they look at it before they bought it? I think they should, they should have to fix these things. If it's not safe, don't buy it. I, I, I don't understand that. And I, I think the landlords should be responsible for fixing these things. So it costs money. If you're a single family homeowner and the roof leaks and you have termites, you have to fix it. Simple as that. Oh yes, Mike. Uh, Mike Byron, Ward One Counselor. Rob, when you go into a multi-unit building, either a tenant has called you in or the uh, EMT has gone in on an emergency and has identified some deficiencies, when you go into that unit, multi-unit, uh, and you work out with a willing landlord, and it's my understanding most landlords are trying to do their best. So when you find a willing landlord, which should be most of the time, I think, uh, and you work together an action plan to take care of deficiencies, um, those deficiencies, if all taken care of, is not going to bring that whole multi-unit totally up to code, probably. Can you just talk about how you work with landlords in trying to correct uh, deficiencies? Um, it, it, it's rare that uh, you, you're unable to br bring the building into full compliance. 
Um, there, there are a number, within the life safety code, there's a number of options. Um, you know, in, in a case where, you know, due to, you know, if the, if the building takes up a substantial portion of the property, so there's no room before you're off, you know, to, before you're at the property line, so there's no room to build an egress structure, you know, a second set of stairs. Um, in, in many instances, a sprinkler system within the building eliminates the need for that second exit. Um, sprinkler systems are very expensive. Um, we... I just wanted to add one thing to, to, to address your question, Councillor, and make sure it's clear to everybody in the room that what we're talking about here are the life safety codes. Um, and there is a difference between the life safety codes, the National Fire Protection Agency's life safety codes, and the uh, adopted building code for the state and for the city of Augusta. Um, I would agree that, that you're, you're not going to bring uh, these buildings up to the current building code. Uh, but it, as Rob has said, you can certainly bring it up to the current life safety code, which is a subset of the, uh, of the items talking about things like uh, fire safety, egress, uh, those sorts of things, as opposed to bringing it up to the entire building code. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Bill. Well, on that point, uh, uh, Rob, uh, correct a possible misper uh, misperception. Um, I think there's been sort of a... Uh, a belief that that certain buildings are grandfathered that are exempted from the life safety code. I'm not talking about building codes. I'm talking about the life safety codes. And my understanding is that is not true. That, that's correct. It is not true. Uh, and so, apropos of what uh, Sue has just said, I, I, I think it is true that you know the prices were going up. That's not just true in Augusta. It was nationally in the early 2000s. You know, it was never going to end. You know. Prices were going crazy everywhere, and of course, we know that the bubble burst in 2007, 2008. Uh, uh, and so those people who bought at a premium certainly probably expected that the value of their investment would continue to, to increase, and they would be able to make the investment in their property, and it would further increase. And of course, we know that that did not happen, uh, uh, that in fact, values plummeted, and we've all felt that. Any of us who have owned property have felt the loss in value. Uh, but I think it's important to understand that uh, these buildings uh, are not exempted from the life safety code, but no one is, is required necessarily to convert their older structures to meet new building codes. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to kind of comment on, on Sue's comment, and it's not to contradict your comment, I totally agree. And during your time in the assessor's office, we worked closely together, and, and I enjoyed that. You were very knowledgeable, and um, certainly, and, and I think of West Coast landlords. We had a few, maybe several, investors from the West Coast buy property in Augusta, never seeing it, never being in the community, and never doing anything to... Uh, improve it or the neighborhood and that's certainly a problem but I want to add perspective to that uh, as a landlord um, that the vast majority of us are very conscientious and we're talking about a small <clears throat> problematic group 12 buildings that we no longer have going and and issues that occur and challenges that occur to all of us most of us are very conscientious and take care of our buildings I'm, I don't I'm not addressing this to you Sue but to the Number one perception that can be made that the, the scope of this problem is bigger than it actually is. And to the feelings as a landlord that we can develop as, you know, we're bad people. And we're not bad people. And most of us are taking care of our, 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 our homes. And I'm not saying you're saying that, so, But I, I'm just trying to put perspective on it. And, and that uh, are concerned about our neighborhoods and are concerned about the city of Augusta and concerned about health and safety. And uh, we're here to work with the Augusta Housing Authority and, and, and the city of Augusta. And I just want the community to keep that perspective that it's not the evil landlord, the, the uh, you know, I can't pay my rent, you must pay your rent. I mean, we all want to do this correctly. <laughs> Tied to the tracks, you mean? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Snidely whiplash, remember those? It's good, it's good ones. Other questions for Rob? At this point, we're, uh, we're partway through the data uh, gathering. We're still waiting to hear 
public comments, and they'll be uh, uh, interesting as well. But I wonder whether you had any preliminary thoughts based on what you've heard so far. Any surprises from what you've heard? Any things that th seem um, worth pursuing? Uh, the council had some, Dave had some comments to the authority about thinking about who, what, are, what is affordable, and what, what, what's the goal need to be? Any general comments uh, from, from members of the board? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Nate Cottonwar, also on the board of uh, Augusta Housing Authority. I just wanted to, first of all, thank all our presenters tonight. Mm -hmm. um, being new to the, the uh, board of Augusta Housing Authority, tonight is an opportunity for me to act as a sponge and listen to the community, uh, all the different facets of the community, and, and take in um, this issue that we, we call housing in, in the city of Augusta. Uh, along those lines, a very common theme that I've heard tonight and I've heard in the community, um, via email, via phone call, um, is that it is difficult to keep up with the improvement requirements for landlords, Dave, and, and there needs to be a funding mechanism for that. And I can tell you, as we work with you, Frank, on our strategic plan in the coming weeks, my number one goal will be to locate, find those funding sources, and work with the city of Augusta directly to, to help try and allocate those out to, to land, landlords in, in the community. So um, it's a top priority for us. I'm going to carry it into our strategic planning, so I appreciate the, the words I've heard tonight. So thanks. Well, I guess uh, my, my, uh, the, the surprise, not, not too much it was a surprise, but uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the gap between Augusta's median uh, uh, income, household income and uh, not just the state, you might expect that, uh, but uh, Kennebec County, it, the, the gap widened fairly quickly uh, and, uh, and uh, continued for basically two decades. Um, and it's a fairly significant gap. And I mean, some of us can sort of surmise some of the reasons for that um, uh, because of the fact that we are a service center community. We do attract people who are seeking services and therefore are, are poor and uh, uh, are going to bring our, uh, our median income uh, down. But the size of the gap, I guess, surprised me relative to Count Kennebec County as a whole. I just want to echo what Nate brought up. The fact that identifying those resources that are available or could be available to help the uh, landlord, the person who is a small owner of property, <clears throat> get some assistance to help make the improvements to make that property safe, clean, and desirable to live in. So, with you on that one. Well, um, I'm pretty new to this, as, as is Nate. Um, I, none of this is, is unfortunately really surprised to me, um, but I, I think Nate hit it on the head. We've been talking internally and are really just here to listen about um, what what the needs are and, and what we can do some creative solutions and and um, get needs met yeah I'd like to start my comment on uh, what Bill said and it, it is no surprise uh, to us because we we're, we're a sprawl we're aware that people migrated just beyond our borders that clearly with the county numbers being the same uh, they haven't gone anywhere uh, they've just moved outside the town of Augusta. And um, we're hearing from a real estate professional that perhaps as they've experienced that lifestyle for 20 years and now they're maturing, there may be an opportunity for uh, some movement back into the town. And we've got to address that with uh, business people, quite frankly. That's not the operation of government to build neighborhoods. Uh, <clears throat> we certainly want to protect them, but hopefully some developers will, will catch wind of this information and help us there but um, that really isn't of any surprise because we've known it all along that you know if you go to Erskine Academy now it's a class A B school when it was a class D school 30 years ago in Moranacook and and all the schools around our per perimeter are, are populated from transference out for the most part from the city of Augusta so the one thing that jumped out at me immediately was the issues that are our goals of increasing quality housing and e increasing affordable housing and the effect that has on rent. I mean, I think they are mutually exclusive. 
I don't know how you can keep rents down and uh, improve quality without an incredible government subsidized program. We talk about Bread of Life building homes with sprinkler systems. That's at great federal cost. And I'm not here to, de to, de to uh, debate whether that should or shouldn't be done, but here at the local level, that's not going to be very feasible to do that. Um, so I, I want a more a higher quality housing stock. Um, I don't know if I can understand how we do that at the same time, increase affordable housing at the same time. It concerns me that if we're going to make it easier to be low income, we're going to attract more low income people. And, and to me, all that energy and money ought to be, and this is and me being outside the box, spent on developing from the early ages in education the understanding of uh, self-sufficiency, entrepreneuring, small business, job opportunities um, that we don't really educate. And I personally have been on an initiative to bring more and more business um, education to, to the population. And I'm just not talking the talk. I try to work that. But we really have a job problem. A lot of these problems go away and quality families come here when we have jobs. Yeah, we have stable employers, but it's a, a fixed, flat uh, employment base. We're not really growing it. We don't have job opportunities. And I don't know that we are pursuing either job opportunities or teaching people um, so that they grow up in an environment, K through 12, to understand, you know, you don't have to rely on the government. You don't have to rely on uh, uh, the big employer. You yourself can make a living. And, and I think that energy is outside the box because we're getting away from that. And, and I can start naming people around town that ran a successful huge businesses and were big community supporters. And where's the backfill of people coming in to be the shopkeepers, to, to run the, the family market or the family uh, auto shop, or the, you know, everything's national franchises. And uh, that's enough, let other people talk. But. So I just wanted to speak to that for a minute. When I uh, gave an overview of the Housing Authority earlier, I gave you the 10,000 foot three bullet overview. Mm -hmm. um, and if I had to add a fourth bullet, I would have uh, let everyone know that we have an amazing program called the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. Yay. We actually have um, one person who is dedicated to helping families attain their goals of self-sufficiency um, with goals of for all families of full-time employment. And that person uh, connects families and individuals to resources um, to help them achieve that goal. And we've had a number of uh, just huge success stories over the years, um, folks working their way through college, um, obtaining their goal, achieving their goal of uh, self-sufficiency through employment, purchasing uh, a home for the first time, and they're now taxpayers in the community. Just some really great things that have come out of that program. So I do want people to know that um, that's it's actually part of our mission statement at the Housing Authority is to work on self-sufficiency, and uh, we do have a staff person dedicated to that. Thank you, Amanda. I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, I said over there on the chair one day and uh, said to the television audience about this issue, you know, it, it may not be the Taj Mahal, but it should be clean and it should be safe. And that's what I'm looking for, clean and safe. <clears throat> well, I got a lot of things rolling around my head, but I'm not sure I can string two of those thoughts together to make, to make sense. Um, I guess the information I've heard tonight is not really surprising, but discouraging. Um, and we've heard from We'll hear from more people, I suppose, but everybody else, everybody who's spoken so far has a role to play or a perspective on this. And um, I guess I'm here as a city councilor, and I'm bringing that perspective to this. And, and what that brings me to ask is, okay, what, what are the strategies to deal with, besides identifying the problem, what are the strategies to deal with this? And this, you know, that was one of the, uh, that was one of the action steps from back in 2007, you know, identify strategies. Um, who is doing things well? Who is doing things that work? Um, 
what what can what can what can a council do to either incentivize or at least not frustrate mm -hmm. uh, interest uh, or development? Um, and um, I'm hoping I'm, I don't have the answers. So I'm hoping to hear more more along those lines as the evening progresses. I have a couple of thoughts to, to what Mark is saying, and, 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 and one is, of course, uh, it strikes me that, that this plan was adopted by the City Council in January of 08, and then for the next two or three years, the economy Thanks. suffered the worst setbacks since the Great Depression, uh, some say as equal to some of the terrible stuff in the Great, in the Great Depression. And uh, I, I know, uh, I mean, I, I don't think he would mind me saying, but uh, uh, Bill Kiltica, who, you know, really put himself out there uh, to do to do Fieldstone Place. I mean, if anybody's given blood, sweat, and tears to making a project work and stuck with it, it's him, and he, he's marvelous for that. But his the, the timing just could not have been worse uh, uh, for him. Uh, and uh, you know, concurrent with that, uh, in the last is the last maybe Frank knows the answer to this or Matt, uh, but but we've gone from as a state from something on the order of sixteen million dollars a year from the federal government for uh, community development block grant funding to be spread around the whole state, <coughs> which is a small amount to begin with, down to about eleven now. Uh, and a lot of the, the programs uh, have been designed to help municipalities address housing issues were, were incorporated in the Community Development Block Grant program. Uh, same is true with other HUD programs. Bill Bernie's here in the room, and, and if there's anybody who has a lifetime of relevant experience to the conversation that we're having here tonight is Bill. I mean, former mayor, many, many years at the Maine State Housing Authority as a senior program officer with HUD now in a statewide uh, capacity uh, and a native of Augusta. And, and uh, uh, I'd, I'd be interested in his reaction to, to some of this. But I, I, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, I think tonight is a great, is a great step forward. Uh, and, and, I, and I do think that there's things that the city and the housing authority can, can do together. But I, I believe we're coming out of a, just an awful, awful time uh, and uh, I know what they've gone through in Lewiston and what they've gone through in Bangor and what they've gone through in other service center communities, Westbrook, Biddeford, uh, and Frank. Frank does studies uh, for, for different clients around the state like this, probably bear it out. But we're not alone in, in what we're struggling with here. I don't know how many buildings have come down in Lewiston. Uh, 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 but, but a lot, and I, I've, I've always thought, compared to the uh, absentee landlords and abandoned buildings in Lewiston, that we were pretty fortunate in, in the scope of what we've been contending with here in the last couple of years. <clears throat> and just to reinforce what you said about the landlords, uh, that's, I think my staff would all say that that's our, that's our experience. Far and away, uh, the landlord community in Augusta is a responsible, uh, uh, eager partner. Uh, uh, to work with us. It's frustrating we don't have some resources to give to them. It's frustrating for them that they don't have the financial ability based on their cash flows to, to meet all their needs. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a minority of, uh, of property owners, mostly absentee, but not all, uh, who, uh, who have not been responsible in at least trying to work with us on those things. So I don't know if Bill had any thoughts on this. Not, not that you're under any pressure, Bill. Uh, <laughs> Shanghai, Shanghai from the audience. No, Thanks, Bill. It. That was great. Oh, well. yeah, I really appreciate that. No, actually, that's, that's, that's um, what the city manager does to form a mayor. Right, right, right. right, right. Um, well, as you know, this is Oscar week. And so I was watching an old movie the other day. It was The Graduate, it was 1967. <laughs> you, you remember the scene by the pool where the... Dustin Hoffman's just out of college, and his, one of his neighbors comes over and says, I've got one word for you. I've just got one, one word that I want to share with you. Um, and I guess if I had to <clears throat> boil this all down to one word, I would say neighborhoods. 
that's what I would use as a platform for addressing uh, these issues. Because the strength of this community, the strength of Augusta, um, historically has been it, its neighborhoods. There are distinct neighborhoods. There's Mayfair, there's Fairview, there's the woods on Western Avenue, there's Newland Longwood, uh, the Pearl Street neighborhood, uh, Northern Avenue, Mount Vernon Avenue. The neighborhoods have always been the strength of this community. And that's where I would uh, put my emphasis is assessing those, the housing needs in each of those distinct neighborhoods and, and biting them off. Um, the housing authority in and of itself can't be, be one, can't be everything to everyone. Uh, they're not going to be able to solve all of these, these issues, but you have to congratulate them for being willing to take a look at it and to, uh, to address it. Uh, just quickly, uh, Council Munson asked about uh, uh, monies for landlords. The, the Community Development Block Grant Program could be available uh, if the city um, made that a priority and were competitive in, and won. And as Bill said, uh, it's very competitive statewide to, to win some money to help the landlords. But it's been done in the past, and I think it, it's something that could, that could happen. And, uh, of course, Council Rollins, the, uh, the other, piece, other platform is the economic uh, piece and I think that job creation is uh, has been the other real bellwether here in this community. I guess has always been a place of employment, and and I think those two things, neighborhoods and economic stability, are the two things that you really should should focus on as you as you go forward. So, thank you. Well, this is the time now for public for public comment. We have about a half hour or so for people to. Uh, um, Make some comments. I encourage you to, to go up to the uh, the, pl the podium there so that people can, the television advised audience can hear. Make your comments around two or three minutes at most to give room for other people to talk. And um, no personal comments. Just talk about the housing situation, housing problems, ideas that you might have. Okay. Thanks, Frank. My name's Kathy Buston. I'm a resident of Augusta for about 45 years with a brief little sojourn into Hollowell to raise my kids. Um, and I guess I just only briefly want to offer this perspective to all of everyone here, um, many of whom I have grown up with, schooled with, worked with. Um, and that's this. There is one, this is such a complicated issue as, as we all know. There is one thing that is free and that is inclusion. Um, that is community inclusion. Um, I have been um, encouraged tonight, for the most part, that we have not um, gone into talking about who's worth having a roof over their head and who isn't. We have come close, though. Um, and I just want to urge that for, for many people, um, I, I grew up in Mayfair. I now rent there, and the only reason I can even do that is because my dad owns the house, <laughs> um, and I rent from him. I grew up here. I cannot afford to buy in Mayfair. Is that because I was not raised to be self-sufficient with a value of taking care of myself and my family? No, sir, it is not. I encountered a pretty major what some people would call disability in my life um, that I have had to work to deal with. Many people who are low income are not low income because of some horrible thing they did or some way they were raised. P things happen to people's lives and part of being an inclusive community is reaching out to each other and our neighbors um, when those things happen. Um, and, and just to briefly say, you know, just living in Augusta, two things have happened to me back in Mayfair. That is this. I go to my front door and get a, get a big flyer, big alarming flyer. You know, you, Mayfair residents, be aware there's a group, you know, they're trying to put the mentally ill in your neighborhood. <laughs> I'm like, hello. <laughs> we're already here, <laughs> I live here and I'm not being supervised, you know, and, and <laughs> that, that, I got that flyer and, 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 and I listened to people I respect hugely have a public forum and introduce it by talking about the burden of the mentally, the mentally ill. Wow, <laughs> 
The other thing, and just by the way, that same flyer, one of the neighborhoods you left out was Glenridge. That same flyer did not go to Glenridge, and that's where the group home was going. These things are free. The other very brief thing that happened to me, I live in Mayfair. I had a relationship with a man that is black that moved in with me and his children. He came to me very alarmed. You got to lock the doors and stuff. And, and tonight, I'm not in the habit of doing that because I grew up there. You got to lock the doors because I see a, there's a lot of police, increased police, something's going on. Okay? He went to work, came back the next day. Guess what was going on? A black man was walking to work in my neighborhood. <laughs> he worked at the gas station on the corner. That's what was going on. Some of these conversations, they're very complicated. Some are very financially intensive. And some of them are free. And I would request, as I did at the other forum, that at some point our officials spark or host community conversations about what true inclusion looks like. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tim Gooch. I'm a local developer. I own Capital Village off of Layton Road in Augusta, which is an affordable housing tax credit project. Um, just trying to figure out what the goals are. There's short-term goals for Augusta, and a few things on the short-term goals um, in regarding to development is tax credits. So my project on Layton Road is a family housing affordable housing project. It lost money the last couple of years. Um, a big tool for the city of Augusta or for developers to use is tax, credit pro is tax credits, which is a tool, uh, a, a financial tool to use for developments. Having said that, I lost, I lost money. Out of six, Amanda and I were at the Maine Housing Authority recently for a meeting. Out of six tax credit projects in Augusta, two of them lost money. Mine was being one of them. Another one, um, another one out of the six broke even. So 50% of the affordable housing projects recently built are struggling. So I think for short-term uh, ideas would be, one is try to get the um, um, rents increased on Section 8. Uh, I know what they use for comps on my apartments, and it's, they use, um, my apartments are new. The comps they're using are apartments that are probably 80 years old. And um, Augusta Housing Authority Section 8 uses these comps and they're based largely on the HUD information. So one idea I had was to take um, representatives from Senator Collins, uh, Pingree, Angus King's office, drive them around and, and show them some of these apartments here and show them Capital Village, what, what we have for rents, and show them what um, the other, uh, <coughs> excuse me, more rundown apartments and try to get the rents increased. Because I think with rents being increased, it will help bring on new housing. Um, and the other thing is supportive housing. I think the supportive housing in this area needs to be increased. I think it'd be nice that agencies would come in and start getting in the apartment business again, start building supportive housing. And then um, the third thing is going forward, I just, based on my uh, losing money at Capital Village and other projects losing money, I just don't see a lot of new projects being built in this area for a couple more years until they're more financial stable, my units are. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gina Turka, and I am the president and founder of the Maine Tenants Justice League. Uh, it's a new nonprofit agency created last year <clears throat> for the purpose of educating tenants and landlords about what their rights and responsibilities are and what the rules and laws are with regard to rental housing. Um, <clears throat> I've been sitting here listening tonight, and I'm really impressed with all the information that's been offered, but I'm curious to know how many tenants are actually in the room tonight because if we are dealing with rental housing, then one of the things that we need to talk about is how these decisions affect the tenants directly. Um, primarily because the, the, the foundation of what we're talking about is private ownership turned into public usage. And when a owner turns their private property out for use to the public, <clears throat> they agree to adhere to certain higher standards of care because they are receiving compensation in exchange for people living in those spaces. And when people live in those spaces, they are, as Mr. Robert Overton and 
Matt and Zar talked about, there are standards that they have to comply with that are not negotiable, them being the life safety codes. I am a tenant of Augusta. I am a lifetime resident of Augusta. Um, <clears throat> taking care of myself since I was 16, so we're going on 30 years now. Um, I'm currently a tenant. My landlord is here, Greg Roy. Um, I live at 32 Court Street, which actually happens to be targeted for demo uh, demolition by the courthouse project that is going on. Because um, my understanding is the Perm Street, Court Street block is being targeted for demolition to make a parking lot which I find kind of interesting that the parking lot is being considered in light of this housing form. First of all, we need to stop demolishing buildings. Secondly, we need to rehabilitate the buildings that are not condemned and still under the ownership of these landlords who either are unwilling or unable to fix them. And I believe <coughs> that the majority of landlords want to fix their buildings. I do have that belief, but my experience tells me different. My experiences tell me that landlords do not know what the laws are. They do not know what rules they are bound by when they open these buildings up for rent. As a result of their lack of knowledge, that breeds noncompliance, which breeds health hazards, safety hazards, which breeds homelessness, which breeds all these other problems. So um, the Maine Tenants Justice League has come up with several programs, which I'll just summarize because I know the time is getting late and I have several people standing behind me. Um, we are looking at creating a tenants land trust, which I am hoping will bring on a, a, a number of community people to create a legal land trust that will be um, for the benefit of maintaining safe, decent dwellings for low-income tenants. And I, I believe the land trust is a more feasible option rather than the Augusta Housing Authority getting into actual ownership because we have the um, dynamic of change of administrations within the government body. And when administrations change, rules change. And when rules change, budget budgets get cut, programs get cut. So if the, if the AHA is looking into purchasing buildings, those decisions will be subject to modification during future administrations, which could very well nullify the project in and of itself. So I don't believe that it would be a practical idea for the AHA to get into, this, into the, owning the project. But I do believe that the AHA is an integral part in the land trust because the land trust <clears throat> needs to be maintained by a number of people, including real estate, government, um, inspectors, landlords, construction, um, legal, so that all aspects are properly covered, properly administered, as well as tenant representatives. Tenants need to be heard as well, especially tenants, because like um, I believe, Amanda, you said that our elderly population is aging. I mean, our elderly population is growing. <clears throat> Logical course of that is our buildings need to be even more safe, not just minimum life safety codes. They need to have accommodations for <clears throat> handrails. They need to have um, accommodations for bath accommodations. They need to have wheelchair access. There's a lot of other accommodations that the growing <laughs> that the aging population is going to need over and above the life safety codes. So um, these are all the things that we really have to sit down <coughs> in a long working meeting, and not tonight because I know the time is getting late, but we need to sit down in a working meeting and talk about these. And the other programs that we're developing are um, tiny or micro house communities. Instead of the Coney Village, instead of the Coney Village, we could create a community with micro houses, which are anywhere between eight foot by eight foot square houses to 24 by 20 foot square houses, which can be built on mobile trailers or in such a way that they can be relocated. Um, we are also working on indoor vertical gardening for small spaces for people who are cramped in their small spaces but still want to benefit from, from organic gardening, and that would relieve the um, 
the weight on the SNAP program, the general assistance program, the food, the food banks and whatnot. Um, a landlord's rewards program, absolutely. Landlords who <coughs> um, do keep their buildings in good shape need to be acknowledged for that effort. It's not an easy effort, I know that. Especially with all the burdens that you guys have to deal with, it's not an easy effort, so absolutely we need to reward you guys for that. Um, also, I don't believe anybody here has made any comments about the Habitat for Humanity uh, restore uh, in Bath and Bangor, as well as the Building Materials Exchange Network in Lewiston. And those are um, places where building, building uh, industry people bring their excess building material supplies for resale to the open public. And the um, Building Materials Exchange in Lewiston specifically has 95% brand new materials. Amanda, I'm going to have to ask you to, maybe some of these can be in a letter that could be sent to the group or something, but you've been over five minutes now. So can you wrap up? I will up? finish up. Thank yeah. you. And one of the other things, everybody here is talking about money. That's the core theme here is money. We don't need money to do this work. We need to come together as a community. We need to put in our time. We need to put in our efforts. We have suppliers who have products that are not moving, that are perfectly good for fixing these buildings. They're not being sold because the building constructors don't want to buy them because the homeowners don't want them, but they can be used. They need to be used. We need to come together as a community and bring in the laborers, bring in the product suppliers, the service suppliers, the government agents, the DHHSs, the AHAs, the CAHAs, and all the other agencies and landlords and tenants. And we need to come together and talk about how can we do this without spending any money. We all have time. There's an incredible unemployment problem. We can put people back to work and we can save money at the same time. Um, I do appreciate the time speaking. Um, I do hope that we talk again. <coughs> And anybody who wants to communicate with me can um, call us at 207-358-8887. Okay, Thank you. Good, Good evening. My name is Dan Bernier. I represent the Central Maine Apartment Owners Association, and I'm also speaking on behalf of the Capital Area Housing Association tonight. Uh, the combined membership of the two associations is about 900 landlords. That's down <coughs> from about 1,500 landlords just 10 years ago. Um, there are many landlords, too, who don't belong to those associations. With respect to the Capital Area Housing Association, 35% of their membership actually lives in a building where they're renting units. S between the two associations, it generally runs about 70 to 80% of the members own let fewer than four units. That's apartments, not buildings. Um, there's a lot of concern, I think, first of all, in the apartment owners areas about generalizations being made about all apartment owners because of problems with a small number of apartment owners. The reality is when you look at the number of units that have been shut down or people who have had to leave their units from them being shut down, it's a tiny fraction of the rental housing in this area. Um, the, we would also ask that you consider the impact of your policies on the young couple that to afford their first house buys a two-family house to supplement the purchase and the paying of the mortgage. Or the elderly couple that to supplement their retirement buys a two-family <coughs> home so they have, a home, they have one unit they live in and another unit that they get rent from. The numbers I just gave you, we're fortunate in the Kennebec Valley in that the small landlords are still relatively strong. The reality is they're much stronger this year than they're in southern Maine and much larger communities where the larger landlords have been pushing the small landlords out. Communities are much better with landlords who live in the community and even live in some of the buildings that they're renting units in. And we would urge you to consider the impact on those landlords, the impact that would have on your community by driving out local landlords for absentee landlords who, can, um, who are better financed. Um, <clears throat> the, um, let me just look at my notes here. One of the things that, as we talk about things to do, is Augusta Housing has the ability to help landlords deal with tenants who are uh, Section 8 tenants who are damaging buildings and not paying their rent. Money a landlord spends repairing damage done by a tenant is money they can't spend upgrading the building. Uh, rent that's lost because the tenant didn't pay their rent um, is money that the landlord doesn't have to upgrade and fix the building. And there is flexibility on Augusta Housing to deal with those tenants. And when we talk about long waiting lists, why should somebody who's destroying buildings be getting their, their Section 8 voucher versus a, someone who's not going to destroy a building who's sitting on a long waiting list? Um, a, uh, another issue that we would cause caution you about is if you drive down rents, that's less money landlords have to fix up buildings. 
and we'd be very that you take in account the impact of what you decide to do on what will that impact will that have in terms of driving down rents. Um, one of the concerns when we were meeting, we had a meeting last night talking with landlords, is there is a concern that a landlord can get more money on a Section 8 voucher from Main State Housing and Gardner than they can for a similar unit in Augusta. And that, it, it doesn't make any sense to the landlords. Perhaps I also, you know, know that there's lots of rules involved in these things, but the, the fair how the, uh, excuse me, the fair market calculation has come up, and a lot of landlords have given up trying to understand the fair market calculation, and they just accept what they're told. Um, so we, but it, it doesn't seem like a unit in Gardner should get more rent than a unit in Augusta, similar unit. Um, the, uh, you know, other things to consider, you know, as you talk about local landlords, local landlords hire local contractors to do the repair work. We're often larger landlords and government <coughs> projects will bring in contractors from away. And the impact that local landlords have by having money stay in your community um, is a very important part of a community. Um, and, you know, local landlords care about crime in their community. They care about the schools in their community. They care about so many more things than does an absentee landlord. Um, and uh, so I would urge you to consider those things as you're moving forward. And as you look at different ways you're going to spend money, maybe the question should be raised, how much further could that money go if you spent it working with local landlords rather than replacing local landlords? Um, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Other comments? Other Hi, good evening. My name is Melissa Caswell. I don't live in Augusta, but I work here for an organization put in by the legislature called the Consumer Council System of Maine. We're a mental health advocacy organization. Um, some of the comments I'm going to say are my own personal. They're not going to, but the one thing I want to say is that the council does have a group of um, consumers that work um, to on issues in the community. Um, and I know that ho homelessness is one of the issues that they're working on, so they would be a good resource um, to you if you needed some um, ideas. And I put that out. And the other thing I just want to stress is the lady that went before me said a few of my comments that I was going to say is about the tiny home movement and the, and the um, homes that can be built on trailers, that can be, can be moved around. Um, some can be put on other people's property so that you don't need to buy land to do that. And they can be done really cheap by using recycled materials. And I think that's important. And one of the things with that, I've seen it done in another state where they actually have the people that they're building the homes for. If you want to talk about self-sufficiency, they've had them build the homes with them. So it puts a vested interest for them in that property. Um, and... I think the other thing, um, maybe community fundraising and donations. I know I don't have a ton of money, but I certainly am always looking to give 10 or $20 here or there if it would mean to put somebody in a home. You can't think about sustaining yourself other than basic living. If you don't have a home, if you don't have food, um, you're not thinking about entrepreneurship or having a job. You're thinking about where you're going to live, how you're going to stay warm and dry, and what cl what you're going to have for food. So without that, you can't move forward into being a productive member of the community. But that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name's Chris McMorrow. I'm a landlord. And there's a few landlords here. We all have these yellow tickets on. And um, I want to address the question that I heard earlier. First of all, I want to thank Amanda for calling this meeting together. Um, as a landlord and part of the Waterville uh, Central Maine apartment owners, it's nice to get some communication from uh, the Housing Authority. We've gone to some of those meetings and uh, uh, Main State and then uh, Augusta and Waterville. Um, I've learned a few things tonight, so it was uh, very beneficial for me to come. Um, Augusta Housing not owning houses and apartments. Personally, I think that's a great thing. I think the voucher program is great. I struggle with whether it's Main State Housing or any housing authority that creates housing, uh, which is kind of direct competition. Uh, but the real issue for me is 
when a housing project goes together through Main State Housing, some of the numbers that I've heard range anywhere uh, from 280,000 per unit. And I think Tim was figuring out maybe the new numbers are a little less than that. Uh, the last time I heard Main State Housing speak, um, I was at a uh, uh, association for the uh, mobile home communities. They were very happy to get 325,000 per unit down to 280,000 per unit. These numbers are staggering. I think the lady that was on the uh, assessor's office thinking, and I think she said tonight, 35, 25 to 30,000 dollars, these people were paying and it was too much. Most landlords that I'm familiar with can put a nice two unit together for $50,000 or less, compared to hundreds of thousand dollars per unit. And my thought to you folks deciding where to spend money, the vouchers pay for tenants who need uh, housing. Private sector seems to be able to do it for very affordable prices. So that's my pet peeve there. Uh, I, being a landlord, I see a lot of need. There is a lot of need for people to have help with housing. Um, one of the things for the council to consider, I looked at a building uh, in Waterville uh, recently, about oh, maybe a year ago, um, 18 units plus some retail space. I put an offer in on it, and then I got looking at it, and it was $10,000 a year for taxes in its heyday. And now it was, uh, the bid, actually it was sold for 75000 So the tax rate on old buildings, if you simply drop that quickly before the new owner <coughs> has to negotiate, that may or may not happen. If that tax base was dropped to 1,000, it would have changed those numbers and it may have been something I bought. Um, another thought on education, I think that's a great thought. I didn't know that the housing did that. I think that's a great thing, Amanda. One of the thoughts, as Main State Housing spoke, if you rent and have some sort of ability to take care of your rent, wouldn't that be a good feeder program to Main State Housing first time home buyers? Thought. Clean, safe tenants, uh, uh, clean and safe is a term I've heard multiple times, whether it's in the newspaper, housing authorities want clean, safe housing. Landlords want clean, safe housing. Keep in mind that clean is normally from the tenant, not the landlord. Very few tenants are av uh, available to go in a housing project if it's not clean when you go in. One year later, it changes, so clean, is, is, is a tenant issue sometimes. And Amanda's written me up on some apartments that weren't clean, and that was the tenants after a year. It wasn't clean, so keep that in mind. A life safety code is my last t uh, tidbit. Has anyone here, other than the chief of the fire department, have read the life safety code book? And then, and then you get the fire code book. They're literally this big, and it's impossible to read. Um, Waterville's fire chief actually gave us some code books to look over to try to look up some different things and as part of the apartment association currently you have to have a PhD to get through it. So when you require all these safety things just really look at that closely. It may just put everybody out of the business of housing. So thank you very much. Thank you for allowing us to come here today to, to speak to you guys. I sure do appreciate it. My name's Troy Henderson, and I don't live in this community. I work in the community, and I work in uh, for motivational services. How many of you here know who motivational services are? Great. I'm in good company. All right, so I work at the Link Center. I'm the coordinator there. And uh, one of the things we've been noticing is a huge population that comes in of people with co-occurring conditions. Do you guys know what co-occurring conditions are? Great, I'm loving it. That's when you have two or more things happening at once, whether it's mental health or substance abuse or some other health thing. So what we've noticed is the population has grown for people who are coming from incarceration or from hospitalization with these co-occurring conditions. As I sit in that beautiful building that I'm allowed the privilege of being in over on the corner of uh, Gage and Memorial, um, I noticed that there's, there's, as these people are coming to me and talking about not having housing, and we've been working on it with the council, the Consumer Council of Maine, to be able to come up with some ideas, quite often some of these people get together and we have an opportunity to brainstorm. One of the first things that comes up is, 
there's a house right next door. Can't we just do something with that one? Which makes a lot of sense. I heard the uh, former mayor talk about um, neighborhoods. You know, that is our neighborhood. And uh, there's a lot of people that come from our neighborhood into our building to, to um, gain some support from their community. And not only are they getting support from us, but in turn, they turn around and give support. So when this has come up, we've talked about what some of the ideas around housing. And of course, we're staring at this building right next to us, which really kind of has moved us to wondering what it might look like if those buildings that are being abandoned, that are not condemned, could be rehabbed by volunteers that would then somehow, through a nonprofit, take ownership and have some type of uh, housing where anybody that's coming there is getting interviewed by the people who are there. And maybe part of it is they keep a couple rooms for um, people who are homeless so that they have a place just to, like a shelter as a part of it. But the people who get in here would have, with the, the income, the, the cost of the apartment would be no more than what? The divided by what the mortgage was held on the place, if there was one, or if it was just the taxes. So instead of having you guys or the feds subsidize housing, these are people being able to take care of it their damn selves. Excuse me. Um, so you know, that's kind of the idea that we've been brushing around, and I would like to explore more of it with, with you if you'd have the time and the opportunity, and we'd like to hear more about that. So um, I'll drop my number off and my email address, and hopefully we'll hear from you soon. Thank you. I will be. Hi, I'm Sherwood Booker. I'm from Waterville. Um, I wanted to key in so on what Chris Morrow said sir. about. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Sherwood Booker. Thank you. Okay. Um, in <coughs> Waterville, they did a project on Gilman Street, 28 units. It cost them over $11 million to do it. At the same time, I bought a piece of property that had a huge fire in it around a corner with four units in it. Um, we purchased the building, rehabbed the building in conjunction with uh, Efficiency Maine, State Fire Marshal's Office, the Code Enforcement Office of the City of Waterville. We put just a little bit less than $100,000 in the property. Uh, Efficiency Maine handed me a check when I was done for $16,000 because we did such a good job sealing the building up. So I'm, I'm just an example that the private sector can do it, and we can do it much cheaper than the, the government. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Tim Kason, and uh, I'm a board member of the Maintenance Justice League that Gina presented. Um, I support everything she's, she's, she's wanting to do. She does tend to go on, but she has so much she wants, she wants to say, and it's hard to get out. I, I can speak firsthand on the foreclosure aspect. Uh, my, my home was foreclosed on last year, and uh, I built it myself, and... Uh, it sold at auction for a $200,000 home for $50,000, which is very devastating. Um, my point to that is that um, had I known of any programs that could have um, loaned me or, or, or granted me uh, a few hundred or even a couple of thousand to keep me going, to get me through a rough, rough time, I could have remained in my home and been stable, been continued to be a productive member. I'm a remodeling contractor, ironically. <laughs> um, I could have continued working and, and helping to rehab some of these houses, but <clears throat> consequently, my equipment is now spread over five different, different places, and it makes it very difficult for me to, 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 to work at all. But, uh, so I would encourage um, the cities or the towns to, if they learn of anybody in foreclosure, to try to work with them and encourage the banks to try to, to do everything they can to work with the people to keep them in their homes. And that, uh, because the only other option we have is to go out and rent, which, as, as that's why we're here, there aren't that, that many, um, you know, affordable places. So that's, that's my point. Uh, help, help homeowners stay in their homes by any means necessary. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, well, thank you for that, those comments. That was very helpful. Um, we you know, have just have a couple minutes right now, and if there's any final thoughts, the uh, Housing Authority Board's going to go into retreat, try to generate some ideas, strategy <coughs> ideas, and they'll be back to the City Council with some of those. And 
Um, any final thoughts, Amanda, Bill? Well, the one thought I have is, is that I think it's just been great that the Housing Authority Board and the Council have sat together at the same table. I've been in this job 16 years next month, and that's a first. And uh, uh, so my thanks to the Board and to Amanda for, uh, for doing that. I th I'm sure the members of the Council feel the same way, and, and hopefully this could become an annual joint meeting to, to touch base and make sure we're all on the same page. I would just like to take this opportunity to thank everyone. I think it was just an incredible opportunity to hear from not only housing professionals, but from individuals within the community. And I'm sure that all of that input is going to be just incredibly helpful um, as we work through this strategic planning process uh, for the Housing Authority, but also as Council talks about their priorities and um, working to address their goals around housing needs. So I always want to um, end an evening with something upbeat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've heard some rather sobering uh, information, sobering statistics, and, uh, and some of this may seem daunting uh, at times, but uh, uh, discouragement is not something that I think is particularly helpful. Um, I think um, while there are significant issues that confront our housing stock in Augusta, and in Maine, for that matter. Uh, I'm, I'm also encouraged by what I see, uh, not just uh, uh, as we come out of this recession, but also the landlords. I know you're working hard to uh, provide quality housing uh, in our city and in, in, in throughout the state. I know that the State Housing Authority, the Augusta Housing Authority, uh, working hard to, to implement the programs that they have been charged with, uh, with enforcing. And I also, you know, want to uh, uh, emphasize that there are other people that are doing work on Cindy. Uh, you know, Cindy Taylor is about to embark upon a significant development of Coney High School, the old Coney High School, uh, for affordable housing. And so there are positive signs. So I'm always reluctant to end the meeting after we've heard some rather sobering information, which didn't surprise us. But this, the, 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 you know, most positive things happen when people have a, um, uh, a cause to work for and an understanding that it can be done. So I ask you to don't be discouraged by what you hear. There are positive things happening in our community uh, and that uh, these things are not going to happen overnight. They are going to be generational as they have been since this country has been founded. Uh, and that uh, people who follow us will be dealing with similar problems, but hopefully when they come and look back at what has happened uh, in our generation, uh, this will be the start of a positive uh, era of prosperity for everybody. And that's really how this state is going to move forward uh, it, when everyone has an opportunity to be prosperous. And that means landlords, that means tenants, and that means homeowners. Yeah, and that's where we ought to be putting our emphasis, is making sure that this state has prosperity and that that prosperity reaches all parts of our populations. So with that, um, I generally uh, ask for a motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, we just adjourn and wish you all well and thank you all for coming. Thank you.